if you can see and hear us. We are probably live. This is Brandon Sanderson. I will be your author for the evening. This is Isaac Stewart. I will be an artist for the evening. Mm. And Jello will be our, um, our wood chipper. Yeah, right um, now he's just a tail. Right now he's just a tail. Uh, the stream masco mascot, um, Magellan the Macaw, will be joining us whenever he decides to stop chewing on the uh, chains that are hanging his toy. Um, I am tonight going to be signing um, Tiffin Pages for the tour edition, I believe, of Rhythm of War that will be available for bookstores to get through the warehouse. And so just random bookstores. I can't even say where they'll have it. I know Barnes & Noble is going to order some, uh, but various stores around uh, the country will have uh, tip-in signed editions. So. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not sure if you saw your social media today, but I posted as you. Mm. Um, and we did questions a little bit different this okay. week. Okay. So what I did was go through some of the older questions that had already been asked us. Mm -hmm. And I put them in a few categories and I sent a poll out through okay. social media channels to let people pick their favorites to make sure we were asking the questions that were of most interest to people. So, All right. Uh, that's the direction that we're going to be going. So cool. I, hope, I hope everyone uh, enjoys this. If not, I guess you won't see it next week. <laughs> we also have um, lots of cool stuff for the Kickstarter to show off. We have some art. Isaac has the actual leather-bound books, the mm -hmm. uh, the first ones that were sent to us uh, to sh make sure everything looked good. So um, that's cool. And in case you weren't aware of the reason, we're, there are two reasons why we're streaming this week instead of next week. Uh, one is that these tip and neat pages need to be in by September 1st is what we told tour we would do and to give the team time to pack them and send them off we needed to be signing them today rather than next week which I think would have been like September 2nd anyway yeah. um, or 3rd so we needed to get them done this week but it was also coincidental because the backer kit went live um, for the Kickstarter and this is the thing where you get to order extra goodies if you want to like if you want to send uh, add a second order um, to your order um, <laughs> where like for instance for your spouse or something like that if you wanted to get all Windrunner stuff for you and Lightweaver stuff for them or something like that you can do that or add on extra packs of the playing cards or things like that that will be live until when Isaac so that'll be live through September 7th okay so uh, I think it it stops that night and then everything collates and comes together on september yep. 8th and that's when we start looking at all the quantities and we know how many windrunner items to get and how many of how many dawn shard to order yep um and so yeah so that's uh that will be like your last chance on that day you just can't add anything more you'll have to wait till we have it available in our store if we do um and so, and if people did not participate in the Kickstarter, but they want to get in on some of these things, they can still do that, right? Right, yeah. Let's say that you, we had a couple of people come to us and say, hey, I didn't see about the leather bound. Can I still get that? This is yeah. your chance to go and still order that. It will come in 2021, anything that's ordered yeah. now. Um, yeah. But it will come with all the goodies, right? I, I believe so. Yeah. Uh, Kara told me it would. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. So it should, you should be able to pick the one that comes with all the goodies, same as in the Kickstarter. Yeah. Um, so uh, until the 7th, we have those things going. You should all have gotten an email by now, right? Yes. Letting you pick your order. Uh, we really need you to pick the order that you want. Uh, I think that if you don't end up picking your order, we might just assign one to you. Um, uh, there's a good chance of that. Yeah. Um, we will probably just pick Windrunner, uh, would be my guess, yeah. uh, for everybody who doesn't pick one. Uh, that would be my assumption, but just so you know, uh, you need to buy the seventh, pick your order, because otherwise we will just lump you in to the Windrunner group and send and, you those. And there, there might be another way that that's handled. I haven't yeah. talked to Kara about Kara's that. Kara's at a knitting convention this week, so, <laughs> um, so, so Quil quilting, quilting, quilting. It's, that's it's it. more of an excuse to go hang out with uh, her sister and her mom and things, yeah. but and do do fun stuff and not think about Kickstarter stuff. Really. Yeah. <laughs> If so she can do we'll that. Let, she's the final word, but she's not here, so yeah. she can contradict anything that we say here. Right. Uh, but I wanted to, you know, periodically through the stream, we will be reminding people uh, who have just joined and things, go pick your order. Um, because, yeah. But we did hit uh, our last stretch goal. Yeah. Uh, so 
uh, Adam contacted Michael and Kate, and uh, we are going to get their next available slot, which probably isn't until the early part of next year. Um, uh, but once they are willing to give us the time, we will get uh, Wave Kings Prime done as an audiobook, and we'll release it for everybody um, uh, for free uh, on SoundCloud or something like yeah. that. To be determined where yeah. we'll release it, but it will be free. Yep. Uh, so... Uh, we're excited by that. A lot of people yeah. were very excited by that idea, and we made it work. So no one yeah. more excited than me. Yeah, <laughs> Adam <laughs> loves. Um, I am excited. So then, yeah, I think, yeah. I just don't like the way it sounds. Mm -hmm. I like then me more. Yeah. So um, <laughs> some something else about the backer kit that we should probably just just mention, as far as all of the items on there, we will. You had mentioned that we will try to have them in our own store. There's a few items that probably won't be there. Um, Do you know which ones those will be? So there, there's the backer pin. Oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. that, is, that is really one of these things that comes exclusive to the Kickstarter. We'll try to do another fun, um, niche pin for if we do another Kickstarter. Right. Same kind of a thing. That, mm. that way they become kind of collectible. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other thing is we, we haven't really decided yet what we're going to be doing with the Sanderson Curiosities. Oh, yeah. Um, Whether that will be available or not is... Yeah, those might yeah. only be available during the Kickstarter years. Yeah. Um, I don't think that we'll just print Way of Kings Prime once, but we might only make them available during Kickstarter years. Yeah, I think years. that's a good idea, just partially for warehouse space and yeah. stuff. Um, that. Yeah, we probably won't keep those in stock. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps when we do the next Kickstarter, we'll have it as an add-on if people want right. to add it and they missed it the first time around. And then we can do another print run for those people. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's... Uh, and who knows, like, the stickers? Will yeah. we have the stickers? Um, I think we're planning to, planning, but we okay. just we just don't know. I think we'll try to order a few extra mm -hmm. and, see. Um, and see what happens. There there are some of the items that... And, and anybody can go to Backer Kit and see how well the items are doing by oh, yeah. how many hearts are next to them. Yeah. And you'll see that some are more popular than others and um this kind of helps us know what to do in the future mm -hmm. it also helps us to know oh you know is this going to be popular for our store it might not wind up in the store if it's something that isn't quite as popular yep so but you know we will try to have some of the more popular items in the store i imagine things like our the uh, playing cards yeah, will be around for a while we'll definitely yeah uh, in the coasters we promise coasters, people we would put yeah. those up so that they can replace them and treat them as a little more disposable if they actually want to use them for drinks and things then you will want to be able to refresh those so so, so speaking of coasters mm -hmm. somebody tagged me on instagram this week and, and said, hey, uh, there, there was a brewery that, that was inspired by your books and made um, some drinks called the Reshi Isles. And then there was another one. I can't remember what it was, but it was a design thing. They said, look at the design of these cans. This is really cool. That's awesome. But uh, yeah, they so somebody also tagged me and said, hey, I guess people have a reason to buy the coasters now. But we <laughs> should also mention that these can be used for normal soft drinks as yes. well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So uh, let's let's do a question, Adam, and then we'll do Isaac stuff in a bit. Okay. So I kind of broke these into three different categories: okay. uh, the general questions, writing questions, uh, and then kind of just general questions about books, mm -hmm. your books, and things like that. So the most popular question for the general questions was, "What place do you think sexual attraction has in books?" As it is such a powerful force in humans, yet a very controversial topic to write about. I think that this, uh, honestly, this is just very much up to the author's individual uh, perspective. Uh, I definitely think it has a place in books. Um, I think, you know, what your goals are as a writer and the, your style of writing is very much going to influence how much you decide to do this. Um, are you ever going to come down, Jello? Oh, did he? And he's gone back up? He's working on that screw. Uh, I hope you never get that out, Jello. Um, well, it's in a stud, so... Yeah. Or a well, he's good at unscrewing things. Um, he, won't be able he won't be able to get that one. Yeah, well, he'd have to spin the whole thing a bunch. <laughs> so, um, But, you know, they, they make stuff that says practically bird-proof and indestructible, which we have bought for him. And one of those lasted two days. Another one lasted a week. Uh, he is just, even for a macaw, very good at breaking things. Anyway, uh, that's not the this topic at hand. So, <laughs> um, it really depends on what you want to do, the style of writing you want to do. I think that it has a place in uh, basically any genre. 
in any style of writing, right? Um, if you want to put it there. Um, one of the things that books um, have a very large, uh, stories fall under a very large umbrella. And what people like or find interesting varies very much depending on the person and what your kind of personal line is. I have found that a lot of times when uh, people try to talk too much about sex and books, it gets very silly very quickly. Uh, but um, maybe that's just, you know, my own uh, personal biases or whatnot. When I read it, I'm like, wow, this, this, this just reads... That there are subreddits dedicated to uh, bad erotic fiction, um, and there are you know awards given to the worst lines and things like that. And some very prestigious writers who are very good writers, when you take some of the writing out of context, um, reads really sillily. And it's just not something that personally I get into very much. Uh, but even in my books, you know, it has it has a place, obviously, because uh, I do talk about it. So I don't know. Um, I th um, yeah. If I can chime in here, mm -hmm. I mean, we we have the romance genre, right? Yeah. And I mean, that's what that genre. A lot of that is about um, attraction, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And it goes all the it, it goes through that whole spectrum of here, here's kind of that puppy love yep. attraction, right? Um, young love, all the way to the gritty stuff. Mm -hmm. And as a writer, you just kind of if you're going to write romance or anything, you just kind of pick where you feel like you're at in that and. Yeah, and uh, romance, it's, it's, you know, we have these genres. Romance is a genre, but it also is an aspect to almost every story, yeah. right? Not everyone, but almost every story, uh, you know, from the Trojan War to the uh, Avengers, um, there's a little bit, right, mm -hmm. in, in everything because it's such a part of human experience. Um, so when yeah. I was... 14 or 15 and find, mm -hmm. discovering fantasy novels I remember secretly really liking like in Memory, Sorrow and Thorn oh, yes. um, Simon's little love story with with um, the girl that was in there mm -hmm. I don't want to be too spoilery even though it's been around since like 1989 right, right, right. Right? there is a twist involved in yeah. that romance that's true um, but I remember secretly thinking that was pretty cool right as a 15 year old yeah it's, it's, it's interesting having a uh, a son who's turning 13 now and who very vocally was like, oh, that's all gross, up until about recently when he just got quiet. Um, and so I, <laughs> you know, it's like, hmm. Um, if you asked him now, he'd be like, ah. You know, he's, he's moved into teenager mode where if he doesn't want to answer a question or if he really does want to answer a question, the answer is often just like, ah. Um, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, my, my 10-year-old and my eight-year-olds still are like anytime there's any the least amount of romance uh it are like throwing pillows at the screen and putting uh um blankets over their heads and like we showed <laughs> them um uh we showed them princess bride did i tell you guys about this and um i the way i got my 10 year old to want to watch this be like there's a kid like you who hates romance who complains and tells his grandpa to skip those parts and at the end of the movie dallin said to me Dad, he didn't do his job. He didn't make the grandpa skip those parts. In fact, he let him tell one at the end, this was a terrible movie, and that boy needs to be fired from his job of protecting me from the romance. Um, <laughs> so, so there you are. Yeah. There's our roundabout way of answering that question. That happens a lot, that where you kind of get off on multiple stories. Oh, you're down. Yeah. You're eating your duck. You can't come over here because if you do, you leap my buttons. Um, this is stand too close. So now he's fine. Okay. So the next uh, popular question uh, under writing, mm -hmm. I categorize it there. He says, in your writing, how have you managed to name such items as shard blades in a way that they emit a feeling of power instead of making them sound ridiculous? Uh, this also is a matter of personal taste, right? I am willing to bet that there are plenty of people who find things I name to sound a little silly and things that other people think are cool that I think sound a little silly. Um, this is just the way language works, right? Um, but what I look for is, uh, is just most of the time, I pick a name and I use it for a little while and that leads me to a better name, which eventually leads me to a better name. 
Uh, once in a while I pick a name and I use it, I'm like, this is just way off. And then I'll change the, the name of the thing or the character just right in the middle of the story and we'll keep going with it and see. Um, and I'll see what the responses of, um, of beta readers and alpha readers are. And a lot of times they'll tell me, uh, this name's just too silly. Or it sounds too much like this other thing or something like that. Um, and... You know, that, uh, that is just how naming goes. It's very much an individual taste uh, sort of thing. I happen to like the, the two mashed up English words because I, I feel like our language, that's, there's so much of that in English. That's how we name things. Um, you know, we, um, you, you work on a typewriter, right? Or you, the famous ones, you know, uh, a driveway and stuff like that. But any conversation you have, Hello? Freddy sounded like a chicken right there. Mm. Now that's his laugh. <laughs> um, you will have just so many compound words. It's just part of English. And a lot of those compound words work for me just because that's how we name a lot of new things in English. Um, what are you going to call this? Well, it's blue and it's a print. It's a blueprint. Like, that's just what we do. Um, and so, yeah. And it, uh, I mean, that goes all the way back to like Beowulf, too, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of, you get that resonance from the early. Yeah, that's the Germanic in us. Germanic German's really thing. good at that too. And it, 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 is, it is interesting though to sometimes see what words work in English and then we go to the German yeah. translation mm -hmm. and it's like, well, you did the exact same thing that we would have done in German, but the two words that we would translate it to don't sound as cool in German. So we're using these words instead. So it is a very language sort of thing. Yep, uh, it's trial and error. Jello, are you gonna be squawky all night he might be we may have to eventually have emily come get him he has had a very loud day uh where he has been chatting and but we might get lucky and he might actually start using his words uh which he rarely does on stream so uh, <laughs> yeah um that right there is his mechanical noise um anytime you turn on a faucet or a blow dryer or a vacuum he does that uh to try to imitate it um and that's great. What are you doing over there? Huh? What are you doing over there? Why are you being so crazy tonight? Is it because we have extra lights on you? You just really want to get over and eat my buttons. Um, from the chat, Jerry yeah. Smith says that you should call your lair the Sandersonian. Oh, the which Sandersonian. Which I really like. Is a pretty good name. I brought him some corn. Uh, we'll see if he'll let me uh, put it on here. If I can get it on. Um, you may have to undo the dock. Why don't you have like a question for Isaac while I give him the corn? Um, yeah, you are so, so a question that someone was wondering corn. about, yeah. Yeah. and I was going to ask you before if this is something that uh, we want to talk about or if we know enough to talk about. Mm -hmm. But they were wondering about alloy of law and leather bounds. Uh, yeah. If we've made any decisions, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, we, we actually have made some decisions about that. Um, so alloy of law and shadows of shadows of self will come together. Oh yes, that's right. The camera is right there. Hi. Um, so alloy of law and shadows of self will be separate leather bound books, but they will be packaged together, not in a slip case. So um, yep. So they will have a they will have a ribbon around them that is kind of a packaging ribbon. They will be shrink wrapped separately with a ribbon around it. Uh, you, you see these kind. It's I say ribbon, but it's not a you know, a silk ribbon. It's a it's a paper ribbon um, that is packaging, and then that will be shrink wrapped around that. They will probably be um, together around 150 as a package. Um, we will um, we're going to try to keep elements of the design from the Mistborn book so that they look good in a line, um, but have something that is a little bit different about them. Are you changing the color? You're not sure. You're I gonna... think I'm going to change the color. And leave the, the foiling the same, something um, like that? Yeah, possibly. I think I might even do a debossing on it. Mm -hmm. So there's a debossing and then foil on top of it. So there's kind of a, a bit of a texture. design texture. But um, to, to imitate in some ways the two foil that we did on Mistborn, I still have to play around with it. Um, I, and I'm I'm curious about people's thoughts. I'm I'm you know yeah. about we, it. We will totally we'll listen listen to uh, to read a response on that. But yeah, yeah. I'm, what we found is people didn't want them bound into one volume. That mm -hmm. was pretty clear in the yep. poll we did um, that they 
either. And a lot of people are like, if the regular Mistborn aren't in the slipcase, then there's no need to have a slipcase yeah. for these. Um, and so our kind of plan is the Stormlight books will all, at least in the Kickstarter, come with a slipcase. So yep. they can all match. Mm -hmm. um, but that the Mistborn books won't, but we will sell them as a... Like, one of the arguments for being able to charge $200 for this one instead of 100 is that it has to be bound in two volumes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's just so long. Uh, we felt that because we're using length as a reason that we're charging more on this one, we should use length as a reason for charging less on those. Right. Um, and so basically having them together at 150 um, is the best balance we've found. There. Right. So we, 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 because of our contracts, mm -hmm. we will not sell them separately. Yeah. They will always... Um, we can only sell... Um, yeah. We have to... If we're going to charge what we want to charge from, they have to come as a bundle. Yeah. Um, so. And this is one of the reasons, too, why people have asked about vegan books, yeah. that we do not have the rights, I believe, oh. to do vegan Don't versions. We? Well, really? at that point, they're not leather bound. Yeah. Mm, well, well it, it, guess if we we'd have can, to look. Like, we'd have to look. There's vegan leather, though. Yeah. So I think yeah. there's an argument that could be made. Yeah, that's we'll true. Talk yeah, let's talk. I think yeah. what we really have are these, the premium edition. Is yeah. Because um, I really We're still want to try to get a I would vegan I love to do that, edition, too. Yeah. Uh, done. Uh, but we'll have to talk to Tor and things. Yeah, we have to talk to Tor and just make sure yeah. that we are in the clear on that. That's yeah. really what I'm saying there. We need One to make the, sure we're in the clear. Some Two of our big goals are to try to get eventually a vegan printing of Mistborn and then also to find a way to print the next uh, Stormlight Leatherbound at least partially in Europe. Yep. Um, so that we can do a save on some of the shipping there. Um, and we found some people who do uh, board games and stuff who might be able to help us yeah. get in contact with distributors and things. So the, the way that we would do the vegan one in the future, if, if we're able to do it, is is probably in a pre-order sort yeah. of way. That way we know exactly how many that we can... Yeah. Um, we will only print yeah. exactly to order on that. And they will be the... they If we can make it, they would be the same price yeah. as the others. But mm -hmm. just have a different material... Um, and look, they, for the try cover. to make them look exactly like the it, other one. Yeah, as close as we can. Yeah. As close as we can. Unless we hear something that says, um, you know, we we would use the same color, but if they're like, oh, we, we prefer kind of a, a woven look over the leather look. Right, right. That, that would be the yeah. difference I there. I imagine some, uh, I, I haven't gotten strong comments on this from uh, the um, cruelty-free uh, um, yeah. uh, group, whether they are, whether they prefer them just to look like a regular leather, regular leather bound that they know that they're not, or if they want to even avoid the appearance of it looking right. like Maybe do a fabric or and something. That, and yeah, um, exactly. And that, that's that's kind of why I didn't want to really commit to yeah. what type of material yet, because I, I need to research that more. Yep. It is on our radar, though. Those yep. two things, uh, we've heard kind of loud and clear that there are um, a group of people that we want to try to accommodate in mm -hmm. both cases um, to make that happen. And you can see... Here is, uh, here is what life is like with a macaw. Um, <laughs> he very, very, very much needs attention um, like a puppy. And what he loves to do is to have his head scratched while he is chewing on my finger. <laughs> uh, and I try to get him to chew on other things, uh, like his own thumb, his own toe, which he does do sometimes. But as long as he's not biting hard. So he know. does pretty well being gentle with your fingers? pretty well depends on how excited he is mm -hmm. uh, like again he's still only about a year old and he gets very excited by things and he doesn't know how to react when there's like lots of new people around um and one of his ways of reacting people are saying you're a little far from the oh mic. one of his ways of reacting to there being lots of new people around is just to he doesn't know how to process it um and he will bite at whatever he's sitting on uh you'll see him do this with his perches right He'll just bite at them. Mm -hmm. That's like a response that you have to too much stimuli. Um, and if your finger is down there, he will bite on that. And he's way better than he used to be. Uh, we've been training him with uh, what is too much um, and things like that. And he's he you can see his he, he like he thinks about it now. Sometimes he'll go to bite and he'll be like stop. And he even did this the other day where he went and he was like no, and then he didn't bite because uh, he knew he'd be told he shouldn't do that. But he doesn't have really good impulse control. He's a one-year-old macaw, uh, not a, yeah. Uh, and so there's a lot of times where he's just like, hey, there's something to bite. I'm going to bite it. Yeah. Huh. You're mostly a good bird, though, right? Yeah. You want more scritches. Um. Um, concerning the alloy books, 
concerning the alloy books, <laughs> I do have I do have some samples of the leathers that I'm looking into, and that I talked to Adam about. And if we have a minute, I could run upstairs, grab it, and just be like, "Hey, this yeah. is what we were thinking." I, I wouldn't mind getting people's feedback on yeah. it because we had a. To, like, tell it is hard to stuff. tell. Yeah, oh, but it, Jacob, go get it. Um, yeah, we can have. Oh, yeah. You you probably know. Exactly I know exactly where, where it is. Yeah. Well, we'll do another question for me, and you. Can yeah, and I'll go. I'll run up and grab that. Jello, I'll be on. right back. What? Come on, come on, come here. Look, I got your corn already. Look at that corn. You're gonna love destroying that. <laughs> yeah, you are like no? I want more stretches. All right. Look, here's the corn. Oh, corn. Go to town, bud. So, mm -hmm. uh, the next most popular question in the next category was, yep. what are two Cosmere characters that have never met and maybe never will uh, that you would most be most excited to write a scene involving? Pretty, I, I've answered this one before. It is Lyft and Wayne. Mm. Um preferably after Lyft is of age and they can go drinking together, I think, uh, would be. But uh, even before, I think they would make a very interesting pairing. So the next one uh, is a very philosophical question. Okay. It says, if a tree falls in the cognitive realm and nobody perceives it, is it a stick? <laughs> uh, yes. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Uh, and the next one's a writing question. Okay. Uh, where do your character's flaws come from? Are they more plot demanded or do they come from the character themselves? Generally from the character themselves. I'll usually, um, so where character flaws normally come from is I am designing a plot in a, in a world and I drop a character into it and start writing their viewpoint through their eyes, see if it works, uh, tweak it, um, maybe try a different attempt. Uh, the most recent example of this is Skyward. Did we post these for everyone to see? We should post them. We have the, the different openings to Skyward. They're uh, posted, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a link on this description yet. Yeah. But it's uh, brandonsanderson.com slash writing dash advice. And uh, we'll get a link in the description yeah, I'll after. I'll after this. Um, you can find, uh, there are three different openings to Skyward where I'm searching for uh, the right voice for Spencer. Um, and the right introduction and the right kind of balance of her flaws. Um, you guys are gonna have fun with this after. Oh, yeah. so what he li he loves corn, dried corn on the cob because he likes to pop the corn kernels off. Um, but that means they go flying everywhere. Um, and so I try this out, and then generally I like the character's flaws to become out of who they are. Generally, I try to mirror the flaws and strengths because I feel like that's how it is for a lot of people. Um, I'm a pretty good example, right? Like um, the flaws to, to Brandon Sanderson, if I were writing a, an arc for Brandon Sanderson, would center around uh, my self-confidence, which is very high, but which strays into arrogance and into kind of just doing my own thing at the expense sometimes of others, which I had to learn in my teens and 20s. Um, that I need to take more concern and understanding for how other people are being affected by the fact that I am barreling forward on this uh, sometimes extravagant uh, idea, such as becoming a novelist. Um, and in many ways, that character attribute, the one that said, no, I'm going to do this really hard thing. Um, I understand all of the risks associated, but I think I can do it. Um, even though it's a, you know, there's a very small chance that it'll succeed, uh, is what led me to being a writer. My confidence in my writing, uh, which wasn't as big back then, but still I would say is better, was better than average, led me to letting people read my books and learning to take feedback and things like this. But that same arrogance, that same confidence, uh, made me a chore to be around a lot of times in my early twenties and late teens. And that's <clears throat> that's just very natural um that the things that that are our greatest strengths uh we tend to start to understand them as such but not see the ramifications of them and when you build a character um when i build a character i mean that's what i'm looking at i'm looking at you know where where are those those weaknesses in who the character is sometimes they are just 
not paired that way, but most of the time I find that they are. That's why I, that's why I wrote the whole Alcatraz series. If you haven't read those, um, it's about this idea where people's weaknesses are actually their superpowers. I've turned that on its head. Um, where the thing that you are worst at, you learn to use to your advantage. Um, but th that's just kind of part of Brandon's philosophy on life, I guess. So Isaac has some leather samples now. Yeah, yeah let's talk about these leather samples. I'm going to start with the one that's craziest and go to the one that Adam and I both think looks really cool. Uh-huh. So here's the craziest one. And it's you can barely see that, but it looks yeah looks metallic. Yeah, it's a metallic bronze. Um, so I don't know if you can uh, see yeah, that. Yeah, that might be. Moving it, it was catching light. That might be a light. little too much, but yeah. it's pretty cool. That 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 was the wild the idea. Dark horse. Yeah, the mm, dark horse. Yeah. So eh, it's it's pretty cool. I don't think mm -hmm. we'll do that. They have a lot. They have a couple of other me metal versions that yeah. I'm like, hey, we could do each one in another metal version. But I think that could get tacky really quickly. So, um, it's too bad we're not doing a physical release party because we could have gotten a book bound in that, just random and test, brought it yeah. as a test and let people see, see what it. people th that think of that. Cool. So that that that's kind of the um, that's kind of cool, but we're probably not going to do that. Yeah. Uh, um, people in the comments are at least saying they dig it, mm -hmm. but yeah. that's a pretty small sample. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, that that's one of those things where I think you could get away with. Sometimes things are bound in two tones. But we're not really doing that with these books, yeah. and so, yeah, it's it's in the back of my head somewhere that it could be used in a way that's cool. The uh, probably this one right here is just a gray, just it's it's just a flat gray. Um, it would allow us to basically do basically blends in exactly with the wall behind you. Yes, <laughs> pretty much the same color. Um, it would look really sharp with the foiling and stuff. Though. Yep. Yeah, those, we those would. Mistborn volumes. Yep. So this this is kind of a safe bet. Mm -hmm. The one that Adam and I really like, and it might be hard to see on this, is it has a little bit of a, a texture to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna yeah move that around there, and um, I I think I would like to do something with this one, um, just because it, it it feels kind of like a bit of an aged leather, um, and I think it could look really good with the. Uh, for the Alloy of Law, Law era books, and then may, maybe like the next era books, we do this. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. um, and then do we, we do. See if we can get them on this camera. Um, if if, oh, if yeah. you want to, yeah. So, so this this is the the one that I don't know if the lighting is very good on that. Yeah, this is not the best for them, so we understand that you're gonna be like, ah, uh, we it looks like a blob to us, but but there's um there's kind of some cloud texture going on with this. <laughs> this is my favorite one. And then regular gray. Regular gray. Which maybe we'll use something like that for the 1980s era someday. That's what I my vote was for. And then uh, Space Age Miss Torn in bronze. No. Um, but that, that bronze is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, uh, the other metallic ones are way more kitschy. <laughs> But yeah, let us know in the comments what you think of those. He is, Jello is very much trying to learn how to fly, but he will not let go of things in order to actually fly. Um, he, he hangs on and flaps his wings as hard as he can. If we ever get him to let go, he actually flies a little bit. He can go, you know, five or 10 feet even um, before he hits the ground. But we have to like get him to like let go of your fingers when he's doing that or <laughs> let go and so this is why i know he's not going to be likely to get to me uh despite flapping around like that um we might flight train him eventually that's one of my goals uh but we will see we have to train him um the m number one thing we have to train jello on is once the pandemic is over and social distancing is over to get used to strangers again because he was doing pretty well with that and would let strangers scratch his head and stuff and now he has only seen my family for five months or whatever right and so suddenly it's like i don't like strangers go away and he uh he hisses at them if they come close or the bird hiss where he's like ah. <laughs> yeah so yeah you do that don't you Oh, and there you go. Right on camera. <laughs> right when I was focusing on you, even. Huh. <laughs> One thing Jello has never done is he has never pooped on a person. Uh, he's just naturally, uh, you know, he has... 
The larger your bird, the better the bowel control. Birds have to uh, birds have to poop frequently to just their their systems move quickly, their metabolism, and they also are optimized to keep their weight down for flight. Um, and so the little birds in particular, like uh, my parakeet beaker, like every 15 minutes. Uh, Jello um, is much better, and he kind of has some natural impulses there. Um, where if he's on a person, he just holds it until you put him onto a perch or something like that. He so far has never, uh, never pooped on a person. So, uh, knock on wood, he just naturally potty trains. So if you can potty train, uh, the bigger the parrot, the easier. Um, a lot of people have their macaws potty trained, uh, but he seems to have potty trained himself uh, mostly. So that's, uh, that's very nice. It's one advantage of having a macaw as opposed to a cockatiel. Um, though it comes with very, very many other, uh, other quirks, such as um, having to have things to destroy. Um, Beaker, you know, he was happy if you gave him a little piece of cardboard to chew on, <laughs> and he would chew on it for like a week, right? Uh, because he just took him a long time to get through that cardboard. And meanwhile, Jello. He can, if you buy the wrong toy, you can buy him a $100 toy and he can be through it in a day. Uh, so, uh, he really likes plastic toys though, which is a good thing because those last forever. Um, let's show off uh, a couple of the art for, um, since we were showing them something that does, they can't really see on screen. Right, let's yeah. Do some art that they can. So, let's pull out one of those things from the, the Kickstarter. Let's or, yeah. start with. Um, we're talking about Jello. Should we do the Jello well, one? Let's let's do uh, the Jello, the Chicken Scouts. <laughs> okay, so uh, I just got these from Ben today. There's one we're still kind of chatting about the design, mm -hmm. but this is the the Chicken Scout um, badges that will go on the sticker sheet. Yeah. Um, the, you can see in the background we're just it's kind of it's still roughed out. This mm -hmm. isn't exactly what it's going to look like. Um, but you can see some of the rough naming that we're using mm. for the different badges, which we, we will polish a little bit more. Yeah. And um, we're, we're thinking about maybe making these look like patches, yeah. the stickers. The stickers will look like patches. I yeah, think that's the right idea. I think idea. that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, and then and kind of, yeah. So basically, the, uh, you could get this sticker pat um, thing, and you could... Uh, you could award people their, uh, you know, their high storm. Yeah. You uh, survived survival, the high storm. Um, things like, you know, you have a friend come in from the rain or they live through a hurricane. You can award them the high storm survival badge. Um, and what are we calling these? Badge? They're merit patches. Merit patches. You yeah. can just award them the merit patch. They'll just be stickers yep. uh, for now. Though, won't the Chicken Scout main one we will do as a patch? Um, maybe, the, so or? the one that's being done as a patch is the... Uh, the um, symbol the, the of the chasm. It's actually oh. the, the uh, oh. chasm. Is it the chasm one? Okay. Uh, what, what did we call that? Uh, great shell wrangling. Great shell wrangling. Yeah. Great. So it, it's it's got uh, the the Jello mascot riding a. It's on there, right? Yeah, it's yeah. on there. Mm -hmm. The the inspiration for this hey. was the um, the Wyoming license plate, which has a <laughs> a guy on a, a bronco. bronco yeah. yeah. And now he's. So, uh, if you're like, what are these Chicken Scout things? It's because we came up with this really goofy idea on a stream once because we were completely out of ideas for, uh, <laughs> where we for stretch goals, yeah. For stretch goals, and we wanted something quick to get up there that was fun, and this took off among us. It is basically a stream joke the rest of you have to uh, be subjected to. And then we sat down and did, you know, some real brainstorming, which is where we came up with the, um, uh, the, um, the coasters and the audiobook and uh, things like that. But this was, uh, this was, you can go back and watch that stream if you feel like. I wouldn't recommend it. It's just goofiness. But yeah, I uh, think that was the July 7th stream. If okay. you're really curious mm -hmm. about it, it was the first, first day of the Kickstarter when we had yeah. the stretch goal. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it had to have been that. Yep. And so uh, we came up with this, uh, this Rosharan Chicken Scout uh, sort of thing. Um, where uh, it depends on what people think, but we think it would be fun to have little sticker pages for the various uh, Cosmere planets where you can award uh, merit uh, patches to those who have uh, achieved what you think uh, they deserve a patch for, you know. Just like, you know, training with a, with shard plate, you guys will have to decide what it means for a person to get a patch for having trained with shard plate. So, so even as we're sitting here, I'm getting more ideas for yeah. things like... <laughs> Meet the Night Watcher, right? Yeah. Uh, get a boon. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and we just imagine it would be it would be fun to be able to number one, you know, make your own sash and things with these if you wanted. But really, the, where I imagine them being the fun is where you know you have had a friend who is always breaking stuff. And they're like, you must have visited the Night Watcher. Here's your patch. There could be another uh, one for uh, visiting the lakes, uh, the Unkalaki Lakes. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, things for different planets also, and things like that. That's just. That's what the fun of these seem to be for us. We don't know if you guys will find them as amusing as we did, but having Ben's uh, pictures of them, I think, is hilarious. And you're all getting one of these if you if you uh, did the Kickstarter on the $200 level yeah. or on the... Um, Any of the levels that give you the uh, stretch goals. Stretch goals. You're, yeah. And I think you can get these. them individually on backer kit. You right? can yes, get them individually on backer kit. The, the stickers for the different orders come in a pack. Yep. And the... We have a chicken scout pack that comes with the patch and it comes with the sticker. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's that. You were, spe you were talking about the Unkalaki, and Michael reminded me. He said somebody asked us to, on the for the live stream to say uh, Rock's name on air, um, and but. Humanukumakialaki Aalunamore. I always it's, miss one. Yeah, thing. I'm, I'm probably going to get it wrong, but I've been te talking yeah. about it with my kids. Because mm. one night we had them on a cup and they yeah. were like reading it. That's right, over here. Oh, just look at Brandon. I'll look at Brandon. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, it's a uh, Numahukumakiaki Aalunamore. Maybe, yeah. I might have yeah. an extra vowel in there because yeah. I don't know if it's Aalunamore. Uh huh. The letter's there. The letter is there. Yeah. But um, you should assume if a letter's there, you're pronouncing that. Because yeah, okay. That's, then it then it is Numuhukumaki yeah. Aki Aia Lunamore. There you go. You've got it. I got Good it. Yeah. Isaac get, did it. But I also speak Tagalog, where they yeah. like to put three vowels in a row. Yeah. That's a uh, yeah. So there you go. You got you did it. Ask Isaac uh, if you want to be able to. Uh, yeah. So there you go, Michael. Mm. Um. So. Yeah, anyway, my favorite of those patches ones is the 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 bird and shard plate. I don't know why, <laughs> but that one just makes me crack up every time because he's like huddled down in it. Right. And he's got like this grin on his face. And um, it just... So my, my favorite one is probably mm -hmm. the chasm camping. I love them all. They're all yeah. great. Mm -hmm. Ben did a great job. A lot of these, he just came up with the idea on his yep. own and, mm -hmm. and did something fun. Mm -hmm. But I, I like the chasm camping because... <laughs> I don't know. As a scout, I kind of felt like that sometimes <laughs> yeah. as a young scout, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Is Bigfoot going to eat me? I don't know. Um, all right. Let's go to another question. Next sticker or... Next question. Next question? Yeah. So the next question uh, regarding your books, uh, they're wondering where Don Shard fits time frame wise. Uh, three months Storm. after um, Oathbringer, which puts it, Rashar in terms, seven months-ish before Rhythm of War. Okay. Uh, ten month years. Uh, so, but we should probably mention that you don't have to read this one to read Rhythm of War. You do not. I have written Rhythm of War in such a way that if you haven't, if you haven't read this, you will not really be confused. There'll be a few things where you're like, "Oh, that's probably what that's referencing." Um, but um, and if you if you read this after, it's not going to ruin either story. Mm -hmm. um, I did something very specific um, with the Rissen interlude in Rhythm of War um, that allows us to preserve um, most of what happened in Dawn Shard so far um, as, um, yeah, so that you will not have it spoiled when you get to that interlude. I've done something very different for that interlude, let's just say. Um, and I did that because I hadn't written Dawn Shard yet when I wrote the Rissen interlude or when I got to the place. In fact, it's the last thing I wrote for the book was that interlude. Um, and uh, let's just say that interlude is uh, it's from a different viewpoint. Um, uh, we'll, just, we'll just say that. Um, and yeah, uh, and references to what happened are in the story, um, but they're mostly kind of vague because n even most of the people in the main storyline don't know the specifics of what happened in the novella. It's it's kind of like uh, what happened in Edge Dancer, where what happened to Lyft is not really generally understood and known by everyone else, because uh, you know she was off on her own. Uh, but as I said, uh, I posted it's it is done. What first draft is finished, uh, and uh, it is Lopen, Velopen, Andresen, um, 
and uh, I have to do the 2.0 and then we'll do a beta read on it and that will tell us how many revisions I need to do before I send it out to everyone else. Uh, while we're on Dawn Shard, we should should mention that we, as soon as we get all of the drafts in, mm. we will work really hard to get it out as quickly as we can yeah. to the printer, but we cannot we, we cannot promise this year. Yeah, we we are bet we're gonna try to have. We will it this try year. as hard as we can. But uh, it's gonna depend on what the revisions look like and things like that. Uh, you will get the ebook this year. Mm -hmm. That we can that basically we can. guarantee yes. yep. by now because we know the book is done. Yep. I know I'm I'm pleased with it, uh, which means that um, you know we will work really hard and. Almost ver guaranteed, but not still 100 percent that it that you get it before if you kickstarted before Rhythm War comes out. Mm -hmm. So you could have read it before. Um, Possibly, yeah. Uh, but if you want to wait, for instance, if you're like I didn't kickstart and I really like audiobooks, we will do an audiobook edition of this eventually. Um, or if you're the type that's like, you know what, I would rather just wait until it's in another collection, like uh, Arcane Unbounded. It's very likely that there will be another collection. It just is probably, you know, years away. Yeah. Um, but you can wait to read it then, right? Like, um, it shouldn't shouldn't spoil your enjoyment of it or ry Rhythm of War um, to not have read it. Uh, the same should be for the rock novella that comes between books four and five. So we've talked about logical fallacies before mm -hmm. on the stream. Um, people are wondering if you have a favorite logical fallacy. Favorite logical fallacy? Uh, you see me referencing uh, False Dilemma all the time. Like it's it's a running theme in uh, the third um, the third um, the third Legion story, which the Legion paperback's now out. Uh, so if people want to grab that, um, that is out. Um, the reason I really like False Dilemma, uh, False Dilemma is this idea where um, you have been presented with two options, as if there are only two options, um, and uh, you're asked to choose between them. And this happens so often in arguments, and even in our lives, where we assume we have to choose one of these two things, when it is a false dilemma, that, that is not, those aren't your only two choices, um, and in fact, they are two very limiting choices. Um, and. Uh, I find that it is the logical fallacy that our, one of them that our brains fall into quite a bit um, is assuming we have to pick a side on something uh, when we don't necessarily have to, when there might be a third side. Um, or, you know, we have to, right now you must tell me this or that. Um, and anyway, that, I'd say that's my favorite. It, it's hard to say favorite with uh, logical fallacies, do you mean favorite, like most likely to fall into? I think that's a trap I'm most likely to fall into and I think about a lot. Uh, but sunk cost fallacy um, is also one which is not a traditional logical fallacy, I don't believe. I think it's uh, an economic fall fallacy. Um, is another one that humans just fall into a ton. Um, and I find myself falling into quite a bit as well. And that, that's the one where you put so much money into something or time that you're like, well, we have to see it through to the you end. You have to see it through to the end because Invested I put so, so much, much into it. And yeah. what it, when it causes you then to invest even more mm -hmm. and lose that um, it is the danger. And that does happen to us quite a bit. Um, it, it becomes sort of a pride issue to us. They're like, I'm, I'm, I can't stop now because giving up. We have, you know, and books reinforce this, this idea that surrendering is always a bad option and the immoral option and things like that. And so we get it in our heads that we need to soldier forward and believe in ourselves and trust in ourselves, which are generally good things, but can be applied fallaciously when it, we maybe should have reassessed and said, you know what, we, we should stop. I mean, the, this ties right into like writing your first novel. Mm. Because you can sit and revise and revise and revise when it might just be better to say, okay, cool, I've learned something, move on to the next one. Because you could keep sinking costs of time and yeah, effort into that. totally possible. Yeah, that, that happens sometimes. It's hard, though, because some people, it's the right move to it continue. It is, it is. Um, so. But that's when you just kind of have to make a decision. And Yep. Yep. So you were talking about Legion, so I had Jacob grab the paperback because I think Tor did a really nice job yeah. on the cover of this. They, they, they've uh, rebranded it as a thriller, mm -hmm. which it really fits into that category. Uh, the um, only weird thing about it is that it is three novellas. Yeah, it is right? three novellas. Um, and they all tie together quite a bit, but it 
it is meant to be read as three separate case files that build on each other. Yeah. Uh, three episodes of a TV show, essentially, yeah. um, is how I imagined that. So, but it turned out turned out really nice. We did really like Miranda's cover. Mm-hmm. Uh, this kind of gets us into a little bit of a different market. Yep. Um, if, so, but the also we do have uh, the ebook for the third one out that has a similar cover. So mm-hmm. if you were waiting to just read it in ebook and wanted to read the third one yep. only, third one is solo has a solo release. It has now. a solo release yep. now. So, um, and I am likely done writing Legion novellas. Um, I still hold out hope for a television show. We have the rights to that sold, um, and there's a decent chance we'll do some audio originals that I'll do with a co-author on those. So if you really like Stephen Leeds, um, I've always imagined Legion as a television show pitch. Uh, that is from the very first novella. It's like I am writing in-depth episodes, kind of like the the Sherlock episodes of uh, uh, the BBC Sherlock, but standalone episodes that build on each other was my my pitch to myself, and that's that's what you get in there if you if you haven't read them. Um, they are uh, Brandon's take on a uh, on a television show uh, mystery thriller television show um, done with a magic system in a world with no magic. So there you are. I can see a lot of kind of Michael Crichton type yeah, influence on these. Yeah, influence. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Which is one of the reasons I really like them too, because love Michael Crichton stuff. Um, all right, let's do another question, then we'll do some more art. Uh, so a writing advice question. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're wondering how do you get into the, in the mood to write. I'm not sure if they're saying you specifically, or if all they're right. saying how can you force yourself to get in the mood right. to write when you may not be. I'll talk about both. Um, so for most people, myself included. Uh, habits are really powerful. They are one of the most powerful forces in our lives. And writing consistently, doing the same thing enough days in a row to build it into a habit is very helpful for getting yourself in the mood. Because if you always work during this time, um, and I do the kind of some, some traditional things. I turn on a playlist, right? That is a signal to me. Um, I'm religious. I read my scriptures right before, right? Like I'm like, I check off the things I want to have done during the day. Um, and they all just kind of fit into this routine of I've done this. Now it's time to do this. And my brain is just like, oh yeah, you've done this thing on the list. You've done this thing on the list. Next thing on the list is to start working, uh, for the day. Uh, another big help is back when I could do this, going to the gym, um, because I could go over in my head for 30 or 40 minutes on the elliptical machine, um, what I was going to do that day, right? It was it was a nice sort of mindset uh, dry run um, in my head of, of what to do. But this is very common for a lot of people that if you build these habits um, and you may need auditory cues, you may need location cues. A lot of people, if you don't write in your bedroom, if you pick a separate room in the house um, or a separate location and you always write there, uh, that helps a ton with a lot of people. For me, I don't need a location specific. I need my laptop and I need my music, um, but otherwise I can do it pretty much anywhere. Um, so uh, if you're having trouble with this, some of the pieces of advice that I've heard that have worked for people are to uh, go write longhand for two weeks just in a notebook in a location, um, uh, taking away the distractions of a computer and things like that. And it can also help you if you're like, I'm going to make this clean and good when it goes in the computer, when I transcribe it, when I'm writing it in the notepad, I just, I can't cross things out. I just have to keep going. Um, Write it in pen and uh, go to the same place every day for two weeks at the same time, write, Uh, for an hour and in that notebook and see if that builds that habit for you. And they they have some cool apps now that will transcribe your handwriting Mm -hmm. and do a fairly decent job, you know, if you're going to edit it anyway. Mm -hmm. So there are also lots of um, writing sprint sites that are like, will turn off all of your other (laughs) apps uh, for 20 minutes and you have to writing sprint and stuff like that. But uh, Mm -hmm. habit, that's that's how I get into um, the mindset is I do my my habitual things. So the next one, um, you've talked about this before. I'm not sure if we have gone into detail on the stream, um, but they're they're asking how did you handle the planning and the foreshadowing 
for a universe as huge as the Cosmere is. It um, will be. So I have a few big advantages in this, in that that I wrote uh, 13 novels, which I've talked about before, before I published, and um, majority of those, just over half, I would say, were in the Cosmere. Now, I started, the first book I would wrote, think that is caught in the Cosmere is Elantris. When I wrote Elantris, I had no idea about all of this, right? I was just writing a book. Um, but then I started writing Dragonsteel, and I'm like, ooh, this will tie in in this interesting way. And then I wrote uh, Aether of Night, where the I'm like, oh yeah, those pools that I put in Elantris that I have no idea why they're there. Let's put one in here, and I'll start dealing with that and, uh, and thinking about it. And um, Way of Kings and the original attempts at Mistborn and all of these things were all of these sort of trial runs. When I got published, when I sold Elantris, I sat down and I did a big sort of revision to all of that saying, what do I really want to do? Like I put the shard pool in Elantris having no idea what it was. I was just there, right? Uh, it was just something for me to pick up later and do something with. Well, where I picked that up with is when I was writing, um, the outline for the Mistborn trilogy and looking at it really close and saying, you know, um, what do I want to do? What are the themes? Uh, things that happened in Dragonsteel that I planned as an outline. I'm like, what if this is the foundational event for building the Cosmere? Um, that's where the shards came from and stuff. And so I had this huge advantage that I'd written a bunch of books that I could make mostly canon in my head that no one else would have access to that already had all of these ideas that I could then foreshadow, right? Like the conversations between um, Hoyt and Frost. Frost is a character from Dragonsteel, right? Um, and, and so that's a big advantage. Um, other than that, I am an outliner, so I've come up with um, some outlines, and I've found that outlines need a lot of flexibility, even if I'm an outliner. And so I make notes of, I am saying this thing here, and this is why I'm saying it right now. Um, but I give myself the freedom to tweak those things. Uh, one of the reasons I've not been firm on what the names of the 16 shards are is because I want that flexibility um, to be able to say, no, this is what the Cosmere needs, is a persona like this um, that has a shard um, and the shard doing this. By the time Rhythm of War comes out, I think we will have canonized all 16 or very close to all 16. Um, but I wanted to take my time doing that. Um, and so don't be afraid. So the best thing I can give you as advice to someone who has done it is write, whenever you're writing something that you intend to be foreshadowing, make a note to yourself while you're putting it in and what the foreshadowing means uh, to re just remind yourself what you've canonized and what your intent behind that was in the story. So that later on when you come back to it, you can be like, oh, you know, my view on this has evolved. Uh, but I can't change this because this I've already talked about. Uh, so let's make sure we stick to that. Um, because you need that balance of flexibility, but also you need to stick to your guns. Like, um, I will forgive quite a bit uh, from authors. Like, a, a good example is J.K. Rowling, right? Um, you know, even if you have something planned, as you're writing a book, it is really hard to get a book written and to have it all connect together. I think she did a pretty darn good job, all things considered. Um, granted, the magic system, as we've talked about, generally you have to pretend each, the new spells they learn are only very valid for that book for whatever reason, and don't ask yourself, why don't they use a time turner here? Um, she's pretty good at consistency inside a book, but how well that all came together is actually really well done. Um, but what I don't like is I don't like the kind of flagrance that some properties take for just tossing out continuity repeatedly. Um, I understand the kind of rule of cool, but it, it bugs me. Uh, it means that it's hard to... Let's see, let's see if I can talk about this. There's, there's a principle that I call that maybe someday I'll do an, an essay or a video essay on that I call the Newt Principle. Um, have I talked about this before, Adam, on the stream? The Newt Principle. So the Newt Principle is named after Newt, the character from Aliens, the second uh, Alien film. Um, and I, there, there will be spoilers for Aliens and Alien 3 uh, in the following conversation. So you may want to skip. Um, and if, uh, if you want to skip ahead, you're watching this. Once I move the duck in front of me, can you see that, Adam? Uh, once I move the duck beside me, nope. nope. Once I uh, move... Like 
here. It's up. here. Uh, I'll have to do. You can just hold it up. Well, no, but oh, the, but they yeah. If they're if they're thing. away from the stream, uh, so uh, if you your come, water bottle. Would water work. bottle. So if you see the water bottle right here, I am done talking about spoilers uh, for uh, for Alien. All right. So there's there's your warning. Um, and so I named the new principle because Aliens is a fantastic film. Uh, it is a really, really well done film, and it is a spectacular sequel film um, to a really good film. Uh, I prefer the second. It's more Brandonish, right? Uh, it's a little more epic. It's a little more uh, world buildery and things like that. But uh, just is is a perfect example of how to do a really nice sequel. Um, and in that film, the uh, the way that uh, it, it's James Cameron, right? Um, that uh, James Cameron builds empathy uh, for the main character and to give her stakes. Uh, no, yeah. Is it Scott Ridley? Ridley Scott did the first one, I think. Oh, okay. James Cameron did the second Maybe one. Maybe that's but, right. It's been a while. Uh, I'm sure the comments will correct Sorry, Ridley, us. Ridley Scott. Uh, I, can't, anyway, yeah, Ridley, I can't remember which um, order his But it is might it. be, he might have done both of them. Okay. Um, I might be, you know, mistaking Terminator, right? Because Terminator... As also has I know has I know James Cameron involved yeah. and uh, yeah anyway, um, but um, so um, you're right. I'm right. Yes. So James Cameron did the second one. Uh, it's Ridley Scott's universe, but James Cameron uh, was the director of the second. The way that James Cameron built um, built rooting interest and stakes for Ripley, the protagonist, is by giving her attachment to other characters in the film, right? Um, you, having seen the first one, realize this is a series about everyone dying, right? That's basically it. And the second movie starts to uh, give you this in case you haven't seen the first film. Um, and you start to realize that you are really highly invested in Newt, this little girl that has survived horrors and that Ripley has decided to protect. And uh, the guy that among the Marines that Ripley is coming to fall in love with. Right. Um, and you realize, you know, these two are people who can't really protect themselves as the pro as the story progresses. Um, and Ripley's entire motivation is not selfish. She does want to survive. Right. But is she knows how dangerous these things are and she needs to become an action star, basically, when she's not set up for it in order to protect the people she loves. Right. And it, it is a, a really well done character arc full of drama, excellent writing, and excellent storytelling. Uh, the third Alien film is not as bad as we all pretend it is. Um, it actually has some, some really good ideas behind it, and uh, you know it, it kind of returns to some of the ideas from the first film and things like that. But the problem is, um, I have a big problem with sequels that invalidate very quickly the emotional climax of the previous story. Um, and my kind of rule of thumb on the new principle is make sure what you're adding to a story does not in some way undermine something better that came before it. As long as you make sequels that don't undermine excellent stories before, I think you're in good shape. You're never in dangerous territory. If you are going to undermine something that comes before, because sometimes you need to do that, right? Sometimes a sequel needs to say, look, the stakes are, we need to raise the stakes and things like that. You better make sure that the story you're telling is better than the one that came before um, or somehow preserves the victory, the emotional victory of the one before. Um, and this is why I call it the Newt Principle. For those who don't know, uh, the spoiler isn't, um, in Alien 3, it's been a long time since I've seen it, but I believe Ripley just kind of wakes up and finds out that the cryopods for Newt and her boyfriend both failed and they're dead. You just start the movie with killing off the, the emotional um, core of the previous film. And suddenly the victories of the previous film are no longer victories. Uh, the whole character arc of the previous film is completely invalidated. And when you do that to me, different people have different reactions. When you do that to me, you are putting your film at a huge disadvantage starting out. Um, another film that did this that's, that maybe um, is a little more family friendly is the second of the new Muppets films, right? 
Um, the setup in the new Muppets films is very similar to Alien 3 in that in the first film there's this huge emotional arc. I'll try not to get into it because I didn't warn people about spoilers about this. But in the second one, they pretend that the first movie was all just a play that they were all putting on. Um, and break the fourth wall and say, all right, now that we did that, what do we do next? Uh, does the exact same thing. Um, the characters from the first one just walk off and never come back. Um, and, you know, the, the human stars, because in a Muppets film, you always have a new set of human stars. Um, and that film, which I actually think is also a good film. I prefer the music in the second of the new Muppets films, for example. Um, and there's some really great performances in there and things. But you start your film off on the wrong foot when you invalidate the emotional investment I put into the film before. Same thing for books. Um, be very careful about how much you are undermining... Uh, the emotional investment that your readership put into a story before when you add a sequel to it. Ask yourself, can I tell a story that doesn't invalidate that? Um, that doesn't um, kind of ruin stories that have happened in the past? And I feel like you'll be a much stronger footing. And also, if you happen to make a great film that is just not a, um, you know, once in a lifetime uh, spectacular uh, sequel like um, I think Aliens is a is an oddity in how good a sequel it is. Um, Godfather Part Two. What's that? Like Godfather Part Two. Like Godfather two, Part Two. Uh, Terminator Two is also a great example. Yeah. Also, James Cameron. Um, um Yeah. Like you make sure. Like for instance, building a second Death Star does not, I think, undermine the emotional victory of the first one because it's like, look, we gained all this time to rebuild and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I might mention, I might mention um, it again. Well, we'll go ahead and move it. We'll move it back. So, uh, one, one thing that is kind of interesting as I think about this is that mm -hmm. um, if, if uh, James Bond were romances, mm -hmm. Um, that or would yeah, that would do that. You would it would invalidate everything yeah. that went before. But they're action movies, so the kind of where right. he has a new a good, romance each time. It, it it's a good example. Yeah. Um. It your genre is going to play a lot yeah. into this. Um. But I could see someone saying, "Oh well, that's what the aliens films are." Um. But for me, that ruined everything about that series, and I have never been interested in another one of the films again. Um because I feel like my trust was betrayed, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, there are ways to do this. Again, uh, adding a second Death Star, but saying, look, we gained all this time and stuff, doesn't do that. Plus, um, I think that the, the trilogy, um, like, I, uh, I admit that, uh, that Return of the Jedi is in some ways the weakest, but it's actually my favorite of the three ones. Uh, I'm one of the few that picks that one over Empire, which I'll admit is a superior film technically, but the emotional moments of Luke and Darth Vader in the end of Return of the Jedi are so good that it overwhelms some of the problems. Yeah, I know. Uh, when I start talking, he sometimes does that. Um, and it's getting close to his bedtime. Um, but And so because those emotional moments are so good, um, in Return of, the Je uh, Return of the Jedi doesn't bother me that there are you know sequels and that they built a second Death Star because Darth Vader wasn't defeated in the first one. We still had story to go. Um, so anyway. So do you think the, the new trilogy kind of undermines the climax of Return of the Jedi because Palpatine... I think, spoilers, yeah. sorry. So yeah, you're giving any spoilers there. Oh, there it goes. Jello. Jello. <laughs> um, Can we get a rag? Paper towel is right there. Jello bird, you flew. Good job, bud. Good job. You really wanted to be over here for this conversation about Star Wars, huh? Um. Great. That's perfect. Thank you. Um. So, um. Yeah. Let's get into this. So we're gonna give spoilers for the new new trilogy. Um. He'll move his water bottle and away. Again. Water bottle away again. Once we're done, because having it on the side that Jello is, um, is proven difficult or dangerous. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So here's the thing. Um, um, is it dry enough? Yeah, there? but it's dry enough. It's okay. great. Um, so here's the thing. Um, I really like both of the filmmakers who are involved in the sequel trilogy. Um, I think they do excellent work. Um, 
I really thought Knives Out was spectacular. Oh, yeah. Um, and I completely understand what Ryan Johnson was trying to do. Um, I really like J.J. quite a bit. Um, I love, like, once he started to get involved in the Mission Impossible movies, I think that their quality just skyrocketed. Um, and I think he's just a really good filmmaker. Um, I think that perhaps behind the scenes there was just not the direction that those needed. Um, and uh, so other people have talked about it better. Um, I prefer, for instance, if the new trilogy, if they had started with, there have been 30 years of peace and the victories of the previous trilogy are have gained this for us. The sacrifices and things done and now there is a new threat. I just think that would be a stronger way to approach it. Uh, you, it would let me, as a as a fan of the original trilogy, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, I'm getting I'm Under getting invaded. Under the table. I'm getting invaded. <laughs> uh, uh, I did not know this was going to happen. Um, apparently, um, do not trip over the cords and things. Uh, Oliver, Jello saying hello to you. <laughs> he wants you to dance. Does he recognize them in those masks? Yes, he, he can hear their voices. Oh. And they taught him to dance, so now he is dancing and saying dance because they always dance for him. Um, yes, uh, hello, children. Who's the third one? The third one is um, the, uh, my Just niece. a friend? Oh, uh, so We are raiding the internet. You're raiding the live stream? Why, why, do you have, why do you have music on the wolf? Because why not? Yes. Yeah. Dance. Okay, Did you I dance know. for him? Okay. Uh, goodbye, guys. <laughs> hey, um, do you want to take Jello? Um, it's probably about his bedtime. So. Oh, you, you, just, uh, re you can move this camera for Emily. Just reframe it when. Yep. Okay. Um, All right. So we're Emily's just gonna hand oh, Jello mind. across. Never mind. That'll Emily, work. and he's gonna go to bed and have his hazelnuts, which he gets at bedtime, which he loves. Uh, and he's going to say hello to all of them. Just twist it a little bit that way. That's one of the cutest things about uh, Magellan. Uh, for all his screechiness and stuff, when he sees someone he knows, he knows to say hello, and he will keep saying hello until they say hello back to him. He does it to the cats, <laughs> and they don't talk back. He gets very, very offended when the cats don't say hello back to him. Oh, it's a cat uh, I know. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hello. 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 Because he knows the cats. Uh, he doesn't ever play with the cats because they're cats, and so we're very careful. <laughs> even though neither cat has shown any interest in uh, in hurting Jello, you just got to be careful. Cats have um, they have bacteria under their claws and stuff. It can just be very dangerous. But you know, when he sees them come by his aviary, he starts talking to them, and they just do not talk back, and he doesn't understand why. Um, and my children are bad at saying hello back. Uh, the poor bird. It's like not. It's not like it's. It's like not petting the puppy when the puppy wants to be petted. Jello wants you to say hello to him. Um, so, I I really like a lot of things about the the new Star Wars trilogies uh, trilogy. Like um, uh, in the the first one in particular, I thought uh, Finn was just a fantastic character. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite all time Star Wars characters is Finn in that movie. Um, and. I, uh, I really think they did a good job of building something uh, that was going to be cool, but it just, I wish they had not undermined the, my emotional investment. I wish they had given me a Han Solo who had spent 20 years being, you know, a good father and a, uh, you know, a upstanding member of the Republican and things like that. And then things went wrong when just recently, right? Like that's what I would have preferred to have had reinforced to me, um, and I don't feel like they did. So that that's what I would say on this principle, the, the newt principle, is just be really careful about that um, because it's it, your instinct is good as a writer to be like, whatever story I'm telling now needs to be the best story it can be. That's where this instinct is coming from. Um, but when you're writing, you know, book five, you're like, I just need to make book five the best I can be. But if you if you undermine the integrity of books one through four, you can in many ways undermine the entire series. And so that yes, book five becomes the best you could make it at the expense of making the other ones a little worse. Um, and that is a real challenge with sequels, um, I feel. Uh, it is the unspoken major challenge of doing sequels. 
There you go. Uh, I'll sometime do an essay on the Newt principle as I, as I, as I view it. Um, but yeah, uh, that's the first time I've ever heard you talk about that. So yeah, it's, that was interesting. It's, it's just one of those things that I have back in the back of my head. It's more like a rule for Brandon when I'm coming up with a sequel. Remember, uh, this is particularly important for like a sequel series. Um, remember that you don't want to undermine what's come before. It, it's also really important for second books because first books, uh, in a in a kind of normal format, your first book is more standalone and achieves and has a success, and then you try to widen the scope with the second story. How do you widen that scope without cheapening the first one? And that can be really tough. It's just a really difficult thing to do. Um, and sometimes you do make those trade-offs. Sometimes you do you you do a Lord of the Rings, right? You say. Gandalf coming back weakens Gandalf's sacrifice in the first film a little bit. And it does. It absolutely does. But Gandalf coming back gains so much more than it loses that the trade-off is worth it. Um, because Gandalf coming back adds really interesting things to the lore. Uh, it does really interesting things to his character um, when he has to become Gandalf the White and come back as the leader of the wizards rather than as the subordinate uh, and kind of take his new role. It becomes really interesting to talk about what is Gandalf and what does he represent. Um, and that's an example of uh, the cost-benefit analysis with me saying bringing Gandalf back is the absolute right thing to do even if it weakens the previous one a little bit. Um, so... It's 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 not a it's not a one to one correlation. It's not a never undermine anything in a previous film. You the mere existence of a sequel will do that, right? You just have to make sure it's worth it. You have to make sure it's worth it, and you want to. Um, I often talk about in writing like there are things you're going to do that I call like red flags um, that you should you should think about before you do. One of these is having a really steep learning curve at the start of your story. You should sit and think, am I gaining in trade off for this? what I want to gain, or could I make this learning curve more shallow, make the story easier to get into, um, and lose nothing of the story I want to tell? If that's the case, then you should do it, right? If, um, if the story you want to tell does not require undermining emotional investments of previous entries, then don't do it, right? It's a red flag. Stop and say, am I sure I want to do this? Is the gain going to be worth it? Uh, or the, the risk that the gain isn't worth it is, am I willing to take that risk? Um, and every book should have some red flags that you, you continue on with, right? This is, this is all about making sure that your story is something powerful and interesting um, and not just paint by numbers, is by doing things against the rules now and then for good reasons. Way of Kings has a really steep learning curve. Um, and that is a red flag that I tell a lot of my students, like, watch out for your learning curve. Um, but there are stories that that's appropriate for, and you continue going after you've stopped and said, now that this red flag is raised, do I want to change anything? And the new principle is one for me, where I stop and I really think about anything in a sequel. Uh, I don't take lightly doing this, but I will do it now and then uh, when, when I think it's good for the integrity of the series. So may, maybe another thing to think about when you're making those decisions mm -hmm. is that, for example, Gandalf coming back, mm -hmm. Gandalf's sacrifice in the, the first story was not the A plot. It was not the main plot. Yeah. It was a B plot. So you're going to be able to do a little bit more with that. You are. But if you get to Return of the King and the plot of the second movie, which is, you know, what is the sacrifice or the, the victory at Helm's Deep mean? Mm -hmm. And it means nothing suddenly in Return of the King. Okay. Um, Which it, it, it does mean something. You're not yeah, saying it doesn't. Right, um, yeah. They, they actually do. I just rewatched them. They actually do a pretty good job of saying, this victory at Helm's Deep has earned us this. Right, Now we yeah. can go do this. Exactly. Uh, they did a very good job of that. But if it, it, meant, it, meant, nothing, if it meant nothing, yeah. that's, your, that's your A plot of, yeah. of the two towers, one of them anyway. Um, it's a bigger plot, so yeah. you lose a lot more by undermining that. Uh, but, you know, again, Star Wars is a good example yeah. where the A plot is destroy the Death Star and we've got another one mm -hmm. in uh, being built, you know, uh, at the end of the second movie. Um, and that was a good move. That was the right move, right? Mm -hmm. um, I believe that trilogy is stronger for having a second Death Star, despite the fact that the, the arc of the first one was destroy this. 
Um, and, you know, Lucas did a, a whiz-bang job of making sure it didn't read like a recreation of the first movie, that the stakes were different, yeah. that the emotional investment was a little different, um, and that the, you know, the, the people involved in blowing it up and stuff were slightly different, and it plays real well. Um, but it was dangerous. I mm -hmm. think that that's a red flag that you stop and say, okay, let's be sure. Uh, the red flag's been raised. Is this what we want to do? But if, if you look at the emotional things of that, yeah. it never felt like blowing up the Death Star in the first one meant nothing. Yes, exactly. So it totally meant a It ton. still felt like it yeah. meant a lot, even if there was a second Death Star. Even if there's a second Death Star, yeah. If that first Death Star had been around and had blown up the Rebel base, then this is a, there's a really cool video uh, on, the, on YouTube, and I don't know where it is. I can't highlight it. can't point to it. Um, that talks about how, I think it was called, how uh, Star Wars was saved by ed the editing, but I can't, mm. un and it shows a lot of the original footage and talks about how um, they added the plot that the Death Star was going to shoot the Rebel base in editing, uh, which is, is the important thing. That that's what changes this, is the idea of, it's not just that the Death Star exists. It's that it's going to shoot and destroy all our friends and destroy our chances of fighting back against the Empire. Um, and that was not in the original cut of the film. Hmm. And they went back and they said, no, this, this needs to be preparing to fire on something very, very uh, important. We're going to have it fire on the Rebel base. And changed everything and didn't have really time for reshoots. And so it's really fun. Some of these video essays will point out saying, here is, what's that? Someone saying how Star Wars was saved in the edit. Yeah, that, that might be it. it. I, I've watched a couple of these. <coughs> that might not be the specific one I'm referencing. Who did that one? Uh, uh, I don't know. That was just a comment. In the, um, the but um, I've watched several on this same topic. That's one of the titles I remember. I don't know if that's the one I'm referencing. One, if it is, they will do the thing in that video essay where they talk about um, here is a scene that they needed to have a scene later on with, uh, with you know, the same characters. I think it's like some of the moths and things like that mm. uh, for firing on the, the rebel base. And they took this scene before and cut it early, took a chunk of that scene and put it later on. And you can watch if you stitch them together, the character walking across both scenes, but they're mm. separated. Um, they took the Alderaan fire sequence and added it in here. Um, and and that's a rocket jump huh. is what someone is saying. Okay. So, um, or several people have said yeah. that. Yeah, it it might be the one I'm referencing. Okay. This is the problem with live streams. Yeah. This is not. Uh, it's not prepared. Not so. prepared. Um, but the, the the cool thing is, you know, they'll point out and say, look, none of the characters' faces are visible during the scene where Leia is explaining what's happening because they have it ADR, right? They have them talking uh, and adding new dialogue in to say you know, oh no, we're in danger of being blown up or whatever. Um, it's not a shot where you see her face because they added all of that. Um, anyway, cool, um, uh, which I assume it's true because I've heard a lot about uh, this topic, but either way, this sort of thing, like having the emotional investment be, I've saved my friends, my friends are still alive. That really allows a second Death Star to be built without uh, undermining much at all. Yeah. Uh, the rebel base was saved. My friends are still alive. We're still here to fight in this third film because we weren't blown up in the first film. Um, and I still have a ton of these to do. <laughs> you guys were like, oh, I'm worried you were run out of stuff to do. But I don't think you understand how big yeah, these stacks those, are. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, they're bigger stacks than they look. What time is it? Uh, it's 7.20. 7.20? All right, I got I to gotta keep going. Why don't we uh, distract... Um, we go back to Isaac and have him show up some more art so that I can continue to power through because I'm about halfway done with what we had to do and it's been an hour and 20 minutes, so. All right, what do we want to move on to next? Should we show another piece of uh, art and then yeah. we can go on to looking at books or something yep. at some point? So um, let's, we looked at the Chicken Scouts. Let's go to uh, the Chibis. Well, no, let's not do those. Let's do the Chibis kind of as a secondary Just subset the, of the first. The other stickers. Yeah, so let's go to the other stickers. So um, you choose your order in the, um, the backer kit survey that we sent out, and you get a sticker pack. Mm -hmm. Or if you've ordered all 10 sticker packs, this is uh, the main character sticker that you get from them. Yeah. Um, and what we have up here, I'm kind of looking over um, Adam's shoulder, but we, we've revealed some of these. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in the meantime, Ben has been finishing some others. So we've uh, left to right, we've got uh, 
Shalon with uh, some of her um, personalities well, there. Maybe some spoilers here too, just so you know. Oh yeah, spoilers. Mm-hmm. So, spoilers. Spoiler. Um, uh, but yeah, there are some kind of alters in the community. Alters. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I wasn't. I wasn't sure what to. Uh, what to call the terminology? What to call the terminology? Because uh, yeah, but her, her other alters there. Then we have Dalinar, um, Yasna, Kaladin, um, Zeth with uh, a little bit of spoilery Im- imagery there mm-hmm. if you haven't read uh, books two and three um Malata, and then a uh, lift with her shard fork which i love mm-hmm. it's beautiful i want one um taln and uh the taln one's a lot of fun with the, the armor is just really glowy and mm-hmm. ben did a, an excellent job there i love his renarin um and also we have uh venli yeah i think my favorite on that whole thing is renarin um, um, he's, yeah the the thing to keep in mind is that these wall won't be on one sheet you will yeah. get a sheet dedicated to the order you pick that has someone related to that order in some yeah. way um and it will have a copy of the symbol for that order and uh the uh, one of the you know the kind themes, of the oath theme yeah the oath theme for that order and then um a character related to that order and then a character related to them yeah it's not necessarily related to the order anyway we just wanted to have right of everybody. For, for example we've got venley and um Esh and I on the same yeah. page and we have renarin and adolin on the same page yeah. so it 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 doesn't necessarily relate to the order. Not not a hundred percent. Not a hundred percent. It's just kind of it fits somehow. We just wanted to do some chibi characters. Right. Um, and let's pull up the chibi characters here. Yep. Since we're talking about them, and I can kind of talk about which ones they go on because mm-hmm. I'm not sure they correspond with. What and we have our hope for. is that this might help you pick your order a little bit yeah. based on which uh, which stickers do you want. Or if you decide you want to go and get the sticker pack. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, on this one, we have Windle, which goes on the Lift sticker sheet. We have Nail, which goes on the Zeth. We have Sill on the on uh, Kaladin sticker sheet. The uh, uh, Pattern on Shalons. Wit goes with Yasna. Um, and um, Teravangian with Malata. Adolin with... Uh, with Renarin, as we said before, and there's two versions of Adolin, one with his helmet and one without. We could decide which one we like better, so that's that sticker pack actually yep. comes with three characters. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm hoping I can fit them all on there. Mm-hmm. Um, um Esh and I and Venli go together, and then we have uh, Delinar and uh, Navani. Um, and the connection there should be obvious. Yes. Um, and what's the last Ash. one there? Oh, um, Ash goes on the tall one because they're yep. both heralds. Yep. So, and th- those are really fun, and all of these things you may see us put on other swag at some point. They're just fun things that it's been really great having uh, Ben be able to spend more time working on these because he, he just yeah. does fantastic art. Yep, he's full time for us now. We can just be like, hey, work on this for a little while, yeah. and we'll just get all these sketches of chicken scouts. Yep, yep. <laughs> and he's on the Facebook feed, so hello, Ben. Hello, Ben. As always, yeah. Eventually, once there's not a global ban- pandemic, and we, he, you know, he lives in Canada, and so even he, he would have to travel internationally. Eventually, we'll have him on the streams with us. Yep, exactly. Um, but uh, maybe, maybe once there's not a global pandemic, or maybe we'll have him uh, come on in one of the later streams, just call in or something. We with haven't the, done that yet. Yeah, so we're not sure. Yeah, we're we're adding to leveling up the stream slowly. We want to make sure that. The stream quality is good before we start doing things like having call-in people and stuff. Which right. we're good to do now. Yeah, just kind of like a big Zoom call sort of thing. Yeah. We, yeah. yeah. But we, we will have him on at some point. And he, he always has great things to say about art and writing and storytelling. He he was a uh, He's done many things in the animation industry, but one of them is uh, storyboarding. So he's really good at like the sequential... Um, Things like that. Yeah, he worked on Rick and Morty for a while. Rick and Morty. He did uh, storyboarding on um, no. Dragon Prince. Mm-hmm. Some of the some of the fight sequences. Hopefully, I can say that he did that. Sorry. If you didn't, it's live. So if <laughs> yep. you weren't able to. Yep. Then, uh, but, but he he's really great at storyboarding and has done some uh, great stuff. What can what are they gonna do? Fire him? He's yeah. ours now. Anyway. He's. Uh, I'm waiting for a text now to say, <laughs> you got it wrong, Isaac. <laughs> Uh, all right, what else you got? Yeah, let's, we, let's go into this. So uh, I'm going to show you. We got from the bindery oh. this week our um, 
two copies of the books together. We don't have a slip case yet, so that's why they're not just coming out to you yet. These are uh, the, some of the first two that came off, so yep. they're still binding these. So we have um, Way of Kings 1 and 2, Volume 1, Volume 2. You can see that they, they, they sit really nice together. They look nice next to each other. The color looks great. We, we, we've not been, quite all the way in frame. Just is it, okay, there. which way do you want me to there, go with it? None of the it? table is in frame. So it's kind of just a bus shot. There okay. Well, I'll, I'll uh, hold it here for a second, and then I'll kind of show you each volume individually. Right. We uh, we should mention again that the backer kit is open. Mm -hmm. It'll be open until the 7th, for those who weren't here when we talked about mm -hmm. it earlier. Uh, you can go and add things. You can uh, join the Kickstarter, essentially, uh, even though it's over. Um, this will be your last chance. The 7th will be your last chance. Please pick your order by the 7th um, if you participate in the Kickstarter of a level that you need to pick a order. Um, otherwise, we'll put you in Windrunner um, and give you Windrunner swag. And please make all the purchases you want to do by the 7th. Yep. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm gonna show you the back here because the back of each one of them is different and I don't think we had uh, shown that before except for in the, the unboxing video we mm -hmm. did earlier in the week. So. And I don't know if the backs of later books will have a different quote or we'll f if we'll just continue with this quote mm -hmm. um, on, on the backs of future books. For, but for now, I think this was appropriate and, and really fun. Do I have it in the right order there? <laughs> I believe so, yeah. Okay. Um, so, volume one. And we try to keep these about the same size. We can't always promise we're going to break them at the end of a part like we did on this one because we have to keep them about the same size to look yeah. good in a slip case. Um, so you'll notice that uh, volume one is slightly shorter by maybe 100 pages than volume two. Um, here, we'll show you the uh, gilding on that, which is really nice. We've, we've shown the interiors quite a bit, so there's, there's not a whole lot to uh, show that's different on that. Uh, but these are gild, gilded. We have these nice, big, thick ribbons, um, and uh, we can show you, you know, just how the the end papers work. Volume two has the end papers of the original Way of Kings, uh, leather bound, and volume one has new end papers, which we've shown before. But there's you open it up and see Michael Whalen's iconic piece, and here's uh, the back. Howard uh, How, Lyons. Howard Lyons, yeah. yeah. He did a, a fantastic job with this uh, storm. So um, one thing I want to point out um, that we've had a lot of questions about with our other books mm -hmm. is when you open these books, and you'll notice that there is a, and I don't know if you can see this, you'll notice that there's a slight bit of a, it doesn't open all the way. This is intentional. This is the way these are bound. You don't want to try to open that farther. There's about an eighth of an inch where they have to glue the uh, the binding to the rest of the book. And so you, you'll notice that also on the uh, interior pages. When Whenever there is a full color piece of art, you can't, it's on different paper, it mm -hmm. is printed in a different way, they can't just... You don't want to force that open too large. Yep, so you'll see that there. There's like an eighth of an inch where they've had to glue this in by hand. And um, they try to keep it as small as they they can, but this is normal. And I'm gonna I'm gonna show you um, a book that is a 250, it might be more dollar book uh, from Easton Press. And this is Dracula. Came in a nice slip case. They do such great work. Yeah, they do. Easton Press is really nice. They 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 seem to be kind of the standard here in the U.S. for nice leather bound books. Yeah. Um. And and we you should all go look at their books and stuff because they've been really helpful to us too. Yeah. They've just been super. Super great people. Yep. So let me show you. And I know they have some Tolkien ones that are just really. Yeah. Really They're up in my cute. office. Yeah. Adam <laughs> has the Tolkien ones. So you'll you'll see here where they have done the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Where this is almost a quarter of an inch because the book is so big. And yeah, just don't force those open when you get it. This is normal. Even even two hundred and fifty dollar books like this one. They do the same thing because this is the realities of binding mm -hmm. um, different types of paper together. You can't just, they're, they're, they're just not in the same signature. So um, I don't know if, if anybody has questions about leather bounds. 
leather bound books you can, they can ask on the stream and Adam can yeah. relay them to us but we're, we're excited to just show you this they are gorgeous um, and I'm just glad they're showing up beautifully on screen as well it, it is interesting I'm going to have to say about the color because we 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 set up the mock-up, right, and, and I made it blue it because... It was slightly I, lighter than that. It's slightly yeah. lighter, but Adam and I sit and debate because we'll get it in different light, and it's like, oh, now it's a little bit bluer with a little bit kind of a, a sea, sea blue uh, sheen to it, and then in other lights, it, it looks navy. So it's just really what light you get it in, um, but they're, they're beautiful either way. So Nice work, Isaac. Well, thanks. And nice work to the bindery. I don't know mm -hmm. if anybody who works at the bindery watches these, but they 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 work really hard on these, and um, we really appreciate the work that they do at the printer and at the bindery. And it's kind of a, a big uh, uh, turning point day for us because you turned in the last of the artwork mm -hmm. for um, for Rhythm of War today. Yep. Peter finished all of the proofreads and copy edits, which were really stressful on him this yeah. time. So if you guys uh, you guys ever interact with Peter, give him a hurrah, because he uh, he went did a lot of work on this. Uh, but Isaac also long hours sometimes getting uh, getting the artwork ready and shipped out. And I finished uh, Dawn Shard yesterday. Yeah. Um, and, and we're getting these leather bound leather books. In, so. so I'll kind of now time to, to pivot. Uh, yeah. And... Uh, it's about time for me to start working on Skyward again. Uh, I have a few other little things that'll take me a few days to do before. Um, so I'll probably start Skyward second week of September would be my guess. So uh, this is outlining? Outlining, so I'll start outlining. My goal is to have the book finished by January 1st. We'll see. Cool. But yeah. So Skyward fans, that's uh, that'll be my next project. And Wax and Wayne 3, 4 will happen after that. Uh, awesome. Guaranteed. Um, so have to start thinking about what to put in the uh, the, the broadsheet for that yeah one. i know it's been a way too long um <laughs> i partially blame tor for this because i wrote two wax and wayne books in a row and said sit on these and you know <laughs> release them it would have been a nice sort of one year and then like had the collection the next year and then a wax and wayne book and then you know it, it would have been just a really nice schedule where they came out every two years regularly but they got a Brandon Sanderson book, and Brandon Sanderson books earned them a lot of money, and so they released one in, like, September and the next one in, like, January of basically five months apart or something like that. And we're like, I think uh, it was closer than that. I think they were, uh, like, four. They were, yeah. they were three months Three months three? apart. Yeah, I think it was, and like, here, October and January. This is, this is why Tor will never get a book early for me again, even if I write it early, um, because... Um, you that, learned your lesson. I learned my lesson. Uh, now, I'm sure you guys are all happy to get it out but it caused a lot of chaos here where we're like suddenly we have to get this other book ready um because they want to release it and we just kind of trusted them like i guess they know what they're doing and in hindsight it was it was not it didn't work well for our scheduling and stuff we would have been so much better if we would have been ahead and had the time to spend on various things the way we wanted to that i guess was, it would have made more sense if it was wrapping up a trilogy but it wasn't yeah mm -hmm. so it was a, a that was a busy year because mm -hmm. we we were doing um, the re-releases of the Alcatraz books that yeah. year. We had the two Mistborn books. We mm -hmm. had um, some of our own little hardcovers we were doing. Mm -hmm. Like, I think both Legions we did. Yeah. And, and then, like, I remember we had, like, a year afterwards, like, nothing. Nothing's getting released. Right. Uh, for, like, a little a bit of a year. breather there. Yeah, but Still that's plenty bad. to do. We'd rather yeah. have them space it out. Stag staggered and things, so... Doesn't mean I'll stop doing secret projects. It just means that I will time how they get released uh, a little more wisely. Uh, why don't we do another question? Um, so they're wondering what media you're interested in right now or what you're looking forward to. So pretty open question on yeah. whatever you define as media. Man, I, I really want to someday make a video game. I really want to do it. I want to make, not just, um, like, I have had opportunities that I've really enjoyed. I'm doing one right now that I can't announce where I'm just, I'm writing some things for someone else's video game, right? Uh, I did this for Infinity Blade. Um, I'm doing this on here. I've had other opportunities come up that I haven't been able to take, but uh, I wanted to, where it's just fun to, you know, to investigate that world a little bit. Um, but I would just really love someday to be like, we are going to make Brandon's video game the way Brandon wants to make it. It would not be a Cosmere property related. I, I would do something built to be a video game, right? Like I want to mm -hmm. do, um, like it would be really fun to do a Mistborn video game. And I'm, I fully, I'm certain we will do that eventually. 
um, but I would like to design a story built to be put in a video game, right? Uh, and maybe it could be Cosmere, but not, not an adaptation of something else. I just want to actually write a video game. Um, I play them so much, and I would like to be able to, you know, declare what the video games, you know, be the person that ha gets to say how it happens, uh, what type of video game it is and stuff. And I would love to do that. That is, that is one, of my, one of my bucket list goals. Um, problem is, I am unlikely to make a cheap video game, <laughs> right? Uh, if you come to me, you're like, all right, Brandon, you, you know, you're going to make a game. I'm like, well, we are going to, you know, we're, it's going to be an open world, you know, uh, Witcher 3 slash Skyrim slash Fallout style. Um, it would probably be a shooter just because I like shooters a lot, but it could be fantasy themed. It could be not where it's like, um, you know, it's going to be like, oh, you don't want to make a $2 million indie game. You want someone to fund a $100 million plus uh, that's probably even cheap now. Yeah, huge tentpole video game. Yes, that is what I want to do. Um, and so if you are, if you're like, oh, we have a video game company, and we we make really cool uh, mobile games or, or things like this, or you know, really cool pixel art uh, retro games, which I do still love. They're great. Um, I'm totally happy to hear your pitches and things, but my bucket list dream is like Brandon makes a Fallout style game or something like that. Brandon makes a Borderlands style game or you know something on that scale. I would just love to do. So if you're a AAA game developer, yeah, yeah, if you, he wants to give Brandon a hundred million dollars. So that's the thing. Yeah. They all want me to write their games. Yeah. Um, which is actually just fine, right? Like games are a collaborative thing. And I am not insulted at all when a game company comes to me and says, hey, uh, we're thinking of this cool game. Here's the pitch. Would you be willing to come on and, and help us work on it? That's cool. I enjoy that, right? Um, and I've done that in the past and, and things. But what I'm talking about here is you have to be willing to say, Brandon gets final say on on this game creative control. Uh, creative control on this game which is essentially giving me a hundred million dollars i don't think anyone's ever going to do it so if you're a billionaire that yes. has a hundred billion dollars or a hundred billion hundred million that you're willing to take a gamble yeah. just reach out uh, we right. will respond to that email yes yes we totally will uh, the trick is um this is this is very dangerous because um uh kurt schilling right he wanted to do this um and he made a um, a, a pretty cool game called Kings of Amalur, which uh, which sold like a million, two million copies, did really well for a new IP, but did not make back a hundred to hundred fifty million dollars because the games that do one hundred and fifty million dollars are very few and far between. They usually have to have console support as being a console exclusive, which is defraying some of that cost because they can't earn back that much money, or they have to be something like Skyrim that the company is going to support for like 10 years and put on all things because... Um, Skyrim, Grand Theft Auto. Yeah, they, they stay in the, the red for quite a long time. Um, because of how much money it costs to develop these. So the, the reality is that, um, you know, if Kurt Schilling with Bob Salvatore and I, uh, wasn't it, was it Mike Mignolia or somebody like that? He had an artist on board who was just um, a fantastic uh, artist um, who had done a lot of cool things uh, before and like put together his dream team. Um, I'm going to need another Sharpie. Thanks. Put together his dream team um, and then made a really great game that did pretty well for a new IP, but still sank the company because pretty well for a new IP is not enough to make back uh, some of that spending. So the chances that this will happen uh, are very slim. And uh, it only happened there because I think Kurt Schilling was bankrolling it. Um, and... Um, um, and I think he lost money on that. Um, uh, Brandon Rulo from the YouTube chat says that they're re-releasing that, if you didn't know that. That's good. Way. That's good. I, I, I know Bob put a lot of work into that, just put a heart and soul into that game and the world building and stuff. He's, uh, he's the author of the Drizzt books, if you mm. don't know. Um, and I know a lot of them ha had really high hopes for that, and I know the game was successful, <laughs> right? I don't know if there's enough Sharpies right um, now. <laughs> it was successful for what it was, but it still didn't make enough just because the the game industry is in a weird place, as I understand it. I'm not an expert on this. 
Um, but the weird place is that people expect a certain, you know, big budget from these AAA games, but to make that back, one of a couple of things needs to happen. Either you need to have like egregious microtransactions, uh, which is, you know, awful, right? Everybody's like, Bleh. or you need to have the expectation that you can support this game for 10 years and continue to make more money off of it, either through DLC or through putting it on new mediums and other people trying it. So you can eventually expect to sell 10 million copies. Um, or you need to be able to quickly then reskin it and release a new version that has a different number in it. Like, you know, FIFA 2019, FIFA 2018, FIFA, right? Like, because there is so much work that goes into these games nowadays, um, that it's just really hard to make AAA games. Or I guess the fourth thing is you need to be a, an exclusive title where the, some, some, like Sony is saying, make this exclusive game. We will give you this much money, the budget. It's partially then marketing money to sell the PlayStation 5. So you don't actually have to make it all back because we count some of that as marketing money. Um, granted, I am not an expert in this field. There are probably uh, n a number of people in the chat who know more about this topic than I do. And I would listen to them over me uh, because I'm only kind of cursorily aware of this. Um, but uh, that's that's what I've, I, I've been led to to understand. Or you need to learn how to make a $20 million game that looks and plays as well as the $100 million games. Um, and, you know, there are plenty of games that do that, that do a, a really good job of making just a fantastic game that you behind the scenes wouldn't be able to tell, you playing it wouldn't be able to tell that behind the scenes they needed to make a $20 million game instead of a $100 million game. It seemed like the when I was in the video game mm -hmm. industry that we were on this, we've been on this trajectory for a while and it I haven't been in it for a few years now but it, it feels like it is kind of reaching this sort of critical mass there were a few new f things that came up and everybody kind of went on to that so downloadable games yeah. when that first came out that was a new field if you could get into that your game would do well and you could make those for like a like a five million dollar budget or something you could like make we, them, we right. went and talked to them and we're like hey do you want to make a million uh, a mess game they're like we think we could do one of these for a million dollars yeah and we were like oh but they're like you would have to fund it yeah and then we're like oh yeah mm, we don't know enough about video games to fund a video game you even did a pitch for a, a metroidvania yeah. sort of style um so Symphony of the Night. Symphony of the um, Night, which, you know, of, when I want to um, play a Mistborn game, game, I go play Castlevania and just imagine that it's Mistborn. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, the the video game world is a very exciting, interesting world. Yeah. Lots of cool things happening. But it's, uh, it's... The next thing that came after that was mobile gaming. Yep. And that was a new field. And and I think that people are looking toward VR and saying, you know, and, but maybe we've, we're beyond that point again yeah, for, with VR. The problem with VR is you need this really expensive rig, Set which up. prices people out. And the yeah. other two things that you talked about, it's like people already have this. We can sell on the phone they already have a cool game. Mm -hmm. Or people have PlayStations. Maybe they will play, pay $10 for a fast, quick, fun game rather you know in between their sixty dollar purchases right. um and it's a very different thing to say maybe they will spend twenty dollars on this game after they have bought a thousand dollar vr rig um it's just it's, a lot of people are priced out of doing that and it, and it seems like the the video game market too especially in mobile has gone kind of the way of the uh the the ebooks dot ebooks i sound like an older person just gone the way of ebooks where the market is so saturated with them that it's hard to stand out oh, sometimes yeah. so you know yeah. how do you stand out i see my, my kids playing these games and there's like they see all of these ads for tons of different games and it's like, how do you stand and out almost all like reskins of each other which yeah is the, and they're all these like skinner box games right where it's like we are not going to let you progress until you buy the the special gems. But if you do buy the spe if you don't buy the special gems, our game is miserable to play. Or I, I've watched I've watched my kids playing these things, and it drives me a little crazy because they get two turns on a game, and yeah. then they have to watch like two minutes of ads. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, anyway, video games. I I empathize with those yeah. who are in them, particularly those who are trying to make really great games um in this market it's 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 tough mm -hmm. there's a lot of cool indie developers that are doing great things like i love um subnautica 
which is just the perfect example of kind of indie game making just a fantastic game that is not about nickel and diming you and just uh, just just a really and it doesn't mean that microtransactions are always bad. Right, yeah. Like I I bought all the the expansions to Civilization Six and I felt everyone was a great purchase. Um, they just they've supported that game the way I want to see a game support where they're like, look, we can continue to make this game cooler if you're willing to keep kicking in some money. Um, and I buy something, I get it, and I get to play with it. Great. Uh, I am totally on board for that. Having come from video games, I understand sometimes when it's like, well, this is the way that video games are doing this right now, and if we want to keep making games, this is how it has to happen. Mm -hmm. So, but And there's still lots of really great games getting made, yeah. right? Um, I am playing Fallout 4 finally. I think oh, I mentioned... That's what I'm playing right now as well. Oh, are you? Yeah. I think I mentioned in my, my thing that I've been saving that, and um, I really want to play Sekiro, but... Um, the PlayStation is um, kind of owned by my children in that not just not just you know like they go to bed and I can play, but it's in their space. And their space is just not a very comfortable gaming space uh, for me. And I like my my computer rig and things, so I kind of look for games I can play. And I've been saving Fallout 4 because I really like all of those. Um, um, I'll, I'll be curious to get your take on it once you've yeah. spent some time on it. Yeah. Um, and, um, are you going to play just vanilla or are you going to do... Um, I, I grabbed a few mods. Um, I went and looked and saw. Um, like There's some things I watch out for and things. And um, I had thought that I needed the, um, the full dialogue mod, which is, uh, for those who don't know, Fallout 4 like, only gives you a kind of couple of words where traditionally in the Fallout games, you see the whole sentence you're going to say before you get to choose your options. Um, but the the Bethesda Fallout games, um, your dialogue options don't influence gameplay nearly as much as they did back in the one and two days, mm -hmm. um, or even New Vegas. So I actually didn't download that mod, and I rarely miss having it. Um, I, I I didn't do that one, but I, I grabbed a few other just kind of stability mods and some little game play tweak mods that I knew would make the game more fun for me. Um, it's, I like that they've evolved the format and they, they're doing different things with the settlement building and things like that. I have my gripes about how it was executed, but I would much rather them do something like this that's different and offer a new gameplay style mechanic, to the mode yeah. mechanic than just making another one. So it gets a thumbs up from me on, I'm glad you did this. I'd much rather have the game this way than not having done it. Um, but as a player, like if you guys don't know, Fallout, there's like these settlements that you can you can build and, and support and things like that, which is really cool because the Fallout games are about a po post nuclear disaster world where you know everything is in shambles and having a chance to kind of help actively rebuild that and like bring civilization back. It's a great addition to the game. But the way they did it is there's like 20 of these. Um, and you go liberate one or help one out with one of their problems. They agree to join kind of your cooperative or whatever. And then you build them some infrastructure um, and then leave. And what it really means is you don't feel like you're really building a base, which is what I wanted, or building a city. It means that you do their quest, you go in, you make sure they have enough beds and some machine gun turrets and enough food, and then you walk away and never go back, basically. Um, because there's just too many of them to manage. And so you do the same small number of things 20 times as opposed to having a really big, cool quest line where you're making a really one really cool base, which I would have preferred. But um, this is still a cool mechanic that I've had fun playing with, and I'm glad they put it into the game. Um, and uh, and it's, it's definitely an addition uh, that is welcome. So I'm enjoying it. Um, I, I like that. Their crafting system, I think, is the best of the crafting systems they've had in a Fallout game so far. Uh, really enjoying the, the way the crafting is working. Um, Storyline is uh, as um, it is equivalent to Fallout 3 storyline. How about that? Um, I am more of a classic Fallout fan that I like the more wacky um, and bizarre and, uh, and distinctive... Uh, storylines of one and two and then New Vegas um, but those ones are built more for role players and three and four are built to get the shooters people who like shooters and things to play as well and to um, and I think that's a valid design choice um, and I think they make 
they make still very good games. It's more about a matter of which flavor you prefer. Um, and I prefer the New Vegas flavor, uh, but I'm not gonna not play this. It's great. Uh, it's still better than most games I could pick up and play, so yeah. Cool. Uh, and we're at 7.55? Yeah, I have to get through these. They have to oh, be they done. they have to be done? They okay. have to be done today. That's uh, right, you that did is, say that. That is required on me by Kara. Okay. So Isaac can take off if he wants, but you can't. No, um, I, I'm here, oh, don't worry. Um, I'll, I'll hang around till uh, So Isaac, what video game are you playing right now? Now that you have time. Photoshop. <laughs> yeah. Clip Studio Paint, Photoshop. That's uh, very exciting. What level are you on? Um, I, I, I would have to ask somebody else what my level of Photoshop is. <laughs> you know, I can probably do this stack and then do this stack at Writing Group. Do you think that would, Kara would be fine with that, right? I can, you know what? I can uh, ask her no, if she's watching it. It, be it does Lester. need to be done tonight. Yeah. yeah. They have to be mailed tomorrow. Oh, mailed well, tomorrow. Well, there we go. Tonight, so okay. that so we have some time too. So the thing you were planning to do afterward, we okay. may not ha okay. we have to That's put just off fine. again. Uh, we we're going to just record uh, my favorite video games that we did in the, uh, the, oh, newsletter. the newsletter. I'm going to record a video version of that so we can put it on the For people website. who like visual media yeah. instead of yeah. reading. But we're not going to do that tonight. Because we, we probably we have, have probably 45 another, minutes. Yeah. yeah. Um, another so, half hour at least. Yeah, congratulations yeah. to everyone it's, it's, on the live stream. It's going to be a long one tonight. Yes. Sorry. Um, sorry, guys. As clarification, you don't have to do that I don't have one. to do that one. We'll yeah. do that one uh, the next time. Um, I know Sean will be sad to hear that, but we... We will we will put that one in next. They 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 have to come in and slot it in various things. So. Kara gives us a big thank you. Mm. Okay. So. Oh, oh, is she, she watching? watching? She's watching. Oh. Kara, Kara, <laughs> you Go are vacation. You are on vacation, Kara. You vacation like I vaca vacation. Um, so, um, but yeah. So let's uh, let's do some more more questions. Uh, so the next one. Uh, as far as popularity goes in the next mm -hmm. section was, uh, do your novellas like Don Shard go through as many drafts as your full books like Rhythm of War? Generally, yes. Um, my drafting process is pretty similar regardless of length. Um, it's just a shorter um, time because it's a shorter book. Uh, so normally we're, we're looking at about five drafts. And so Don Shard is 1.0. Um, I will do a 2.0 probably next week. Um, um, will you go walk over and ask her? Yes, I told her to contact Jacob if she did, but um, I don't know if she has his text. She's, they're asking if my, my wife wants dinner. She may already have had dinner. 8.30 is not a dinner time for Emily, uh, but she may still want some. So if you would, that would be still lunch time for Brandon. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we, I'm good. Um, so, um, blah, 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 blah. Oh, five yeah. drafts. There'll be about five drafts. Now, sometimes I do that in four drafts. Uh, it depends on how many polishing drafts I feel I need. But usually it's 1.0. Then 2.0 is fix all the problems I know it has. Uh, 3.0 is enter alpha reader comments. 4.0 is off, uh, um, uh, put in beta reader comments. 5.0 is the final polish. And I imagine it will go through four or five drafts. Once in a while, like on a short book, we can combine alpha reader and beta reader comments because it's not as overwhelming to, to collate on a 40,000 word not, uh, thing. Um, and so sometimes that dra those drafts go together, but uh, not always. So we'll see. Uh, the next question is, as a medical student who is currently in my musculoskeletal class, mm. how different is the internal anatomy of the quote-unquote humans of the worlds of the Cosmere, uh, like structure and number of muscles, bones, organs, things like that? Uh, in general, you're not, you wouldn't have a problem. Anything that is... Uh, there would be minor differences. Um, like, there's going to be some slight anatomy differences um, for, like, scadrians, right? Where we're changed to deal with the, the dust and stuff and things like that. So you, you'd be like, wow, the, the lungs are different here. Uh, the ash, I mean. And um, Roshar is a lower gravity, higher oxygen environment. And, you know, you're going to find... Uh, longer bones, you're going to find, you know, just stuff like that um, on Roshar. But in general, you would be like, this is a human who has been, um, who is, whose species has slightly evolved toward a different environment, uh, rather than this is not human at all. Now, if you were to ask about an AMEAN, either variety, you would, uh, you would be, they would be very, very, very different. Uh, you would be 
you would be like Bones trying to operate on um, on Spock. Uh, the sleepless would be, <laughs> you'd need like a very different degree for dealing with them. Uh, I'm very excited to eventually get the sleepless <coughs> um, into fully into the, the stories. Um, they're from my second novel, um, Star's End. Uh, oh. uh, is where the very first appearance of them um, and then got ported over to the Cosmere once I designed the Cosmere um, and are really cool in my mind science fiction race um, that are uh, not a hive mind but they are a, a, a individual is made up of a group of, uh, of insects, large insects uh, that share cognitive uh, load across all of them, and there's just so many fun things you can do with that because they can uh, they can selectively breed parts of their own body to do different things and have like five generations or fifty generations of this group of insect um, that they are selectively breeding to do this specific thing um, and stuff like that. So it's very cool, but there hasn't been a lot of space for them in the, the Cosmere yet. Uh, just just some brief appearances. They'll be very important during the space age. So here's a question that I'll ask to both of you. Mm -hmm. um, what is your favorite thing that has come out of the Kickstarter campaign so far? And let me just say, you can't pick the leather bound. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, it's it's the Chicken Scouts, right? <laughs> um, it's it's absolutely the the Chicken Scouts. Well, no, honestly, I like the coasters better. Mm. Uh, the coasters are my favorite uh, happy uh, accident. Happy accident. A it's not accident. We designed it, but sitting around and saying, what are, what should we do? What what would these and coming up with these fun uh, in world coasters? They are my favorite thing that came out of this unexpectedly. Isaac. Um, so I, I really like the coasters. That was a lot, a lot of fun. But I mean, we're looking at, I think the coins I'm really excited mm. about. And another thing, I'm excited about the Sanderson Curiosities. I know that wasn't right. one of the on, on, um, spot, on the spot things that we right. were doing. But I mean, back when I first met you and we were, you know, you had one book out and I was looking through your old, um, Brandon books I, I made a Star's End for you, and I made it fake, a fake leather bound, right? It was just I still printed. have this wonderful thing. It's a gift that Isaac gave me where he bound that, the first Sanderson Curiosity. Yeah. So, I mean, it, that's kind of a combination of the mm -hmm. Sanderson Curiosities and the leather bounds put together. That, But now that we get to go back and kind of bind some of these in a cool way, both the Sanderson Curiosities, some of them, and, and the new books in um, Leatherbound. That's just kind of cool, I think, that we get to do that. If we ever have a physical bookstore, we will have the Star's End there. Um, it may be the only edition. It's possible, like, Star's End's the only readable one. Uh, maybe Pandora, Sixth Incarnation Pandora, but uh, of those early books. Um, mm -hmm. But it's still, I mean, it's not great um <laughs> I've, I've read parts of star's end and it was fun yeah i mean uh, the, the the cool thing about these that I, I i would like people to know is that um as i've read your early books that yeah they're early books but there's you can tell that you enjoy re writing a story and there's fun things about it and there's cool things that still grab your attention and you go yeah this this guy i hope he gets encouragement because he will be a good writer someday someday yeah so the next question, um, and I don't know if you'll be able to speak to this because it's been a while since you started, uh, but they said, uh, what constitutes a good deal in traditional publishing today? Boy, Ooh. it is. you need to ask that um, to uh, people who are breaking in right now. I would say that a, um, a good deal right now, if you're going to say what's good, um, I would be looking for... Um, I would be looking for a higher advance now to convince me to go traditional as a new author than I would have been during my era. So I got offered 5000 and we talked them up to 10000 for Elantris and 10000 for Miss Ford as an advance. And that was pretty standard at that the time. That was pretty standard. Like uh, Toby Buckell did a, um, a, a survey of authors um, around the time, it was a few years later, but he's like, what were your first advances and what your, are your current advances? And he came out with like a $6,000 average for a first book, um, which, you know what, was was actually just fine um, back then because um, 
traditional publishing was the only game in town, but there were six publishers, right? And they tended to, the market had found, what about you could take a risk on a new author um, that doesn't have any hype behind them and things, and what about you could pay? Um, and yeah, you can't live on $5,000, but the idea is that this is just a way to kind of kickstart your career, just fine. Uh, the issue now is that um, making $5,000 off of a book uh, that you are self-publishing, it's not that hard to do. Um, it is still hard, right? This You still have to be a good writer um, and you still have to put in the legwork, but I think a lot of the self-published people would say, you know, yeah, $5,000, like you own the rights to this book, you keep it up there for 10 years, you're gonna make that on your book. Um, and taking that from a traditional publishing route might be an unwise move. Uh, it might be a wise move. It depends on your personal, uh, you know, what you're looking for. Go watch the lectures we've talked about. But what a publisher is promising you with publishing your book is that they can reach more people, they can market it better, they can get it in front of, they can launch you better than you could launch yourself, and you are willing to give up a big chunk of your profit on individual books in order to sell way more books. Uh, that is what uh, a traditional publishing thing should be. And so, um, you know, I would be holding out for a little more money, more likely, where I'm like, if they're only going to pay $5,000, right, or even $10,000, like, I'm just going to get lost, right? What? Why wouldn't I just self-publish this? Well, there are still good answers to that, uh, that you just don't want to do that work, right? That's not something that interests you, excites you, or you, you find the idea of coming up with your own cover, of copy editing and editing it yourself and releasing it and all of that. You find that really intimidating. I've got friends, they're like, I just never would want to do that. That's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with you. But you have to become the project manager at that yeah, point. And that's um, a lot of work. And it is a lot of work. But at the same time, like if you were to go to talk to Jancy or, you know, one of my other friends who's an indie published and say, what would you say? I think they would say 5,000, do not take 5,000. Um, you can get 5,000. Hold out for more. Uh, wait until you've got a book that everyone's really interested in. I don't know about that. Uh, I just am not doing it. Like I'm not you, I can't say. Um, what is a good deal? I have still heard of high five figure deals. Um, all the books that I hear about when the publisher comes and says, hey, we want you to cover quote this. Like if they're going to Brandon and asking for a potential cover quote, they have never paid less than mid to high five figures. That's not a, they don't go to me unless they've already sunk money into it, right? And so, and when I hear my agent say, you know, this book is gonna be really hot, it's always a book that they got um, mid to high five figures or low six figures on as an advance. That's all I hear about because the ones that they're paying 5,000 for, they're not going and saying, well, let's use our favor with Brandon to get Brandon to take a look at it. They just aren't doing that um, because there's, you know, too many, you only get it once in a while to get me to, like, I promised Joshua I would look at books that he really wants me to look at. Um, and, you know, Davey at Tor has the same sort of promise. And they use that very judiciously, as they should. Um, and so, yeah, anyway, that's just, what does a good do deal look like right now? Another person to talk to, you know, like be like Michael J. Sullivan. Um, what does a great deal look like? I have a great deal, right? but I already have a name and things like that. Like the things I can demand from publishers are beyond what even most professional writers can demand from publishers. Um, so, you know, that's why I'm still with a publisher rather than, than self-publishing um, because I, I really like the team at Tor. They do a great job and they have accommodated my requests uh, to be more of a co-publisher as opposed to uh, just a regular author that they publish. Um, but yeah, anyway, what is it, what does it look like right now? I, I can't say other than I think you should be getting mid five figures instead of low five figures. At least you should be, um, you should be very, uh, you should be compensated for your audio rights to an extreme amount, or you should be given your audio rights because audio is the growth part of the industry right now and is the place that everyone's excited. And it is not that hard to sell a book directly to Audible, even if it hasn't been published. 
um, and to make good money off of that because it is the growth segment of the, uh, of the market. Like, well, we just got numbers from Tor on something, right? like last week, last month or something, and we were up to like 83% digital, um, right? Oh, was this the comparison that we saw? Yeah. So Be- between the last book and this one? Yeah, between the last yeah. book. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what it was. It's the pre-orders, the pre-orders um, between... Uh, Oathbringer and Rhythm of War, and, and and we are now eighty three percent. That's digital split between ebook and audiobook, mm-hmm. and the previous one was eighty percent, right? And so that three percent gain is all audiobook. In fact, Audio. audiobook is gobbled up about three percent of the physical uh, print and about six yeah. or seven percent of the ebook. Um, we were we were roughly similar, I guess, on on the ebooks and the the hardcovers, right? Roughly similar. No, no, ebooks no? were more. They were yeah. more. Yeah. Okay. Um, ebooks but, were were more. They were roughly similar to last time. Yeah. But so we are we are bigger by about fifty percent on this pre order. I think fifty mm-hmm. percent uh, larger than where we were on Oathbringer. But at the where time. we saw the biggest but the amount. The big gain yeah. was in audio. It was audio that I looked at that and thought. Wow. And we are higher in audio than average because it's just such a good deal. Um, because you can you know you spend a credit on it mm-hmm. right, um, and we actually make about as much off of that credit as we do off of the ebook and things. And so it's actually still a good deal for us. Uh, you don't cost us anything by buying, you know, I think we actually make a little more off the audiobook even still than we make off of the print edition and a little less than the ebook, but within negligible tolerances. And so um, you don't have to worry about us, but it is really interesting to see that audiobook. And we have Michael and Kate who are just fantastic. And uh, also they're just really spectacular deals. Uh, if you're going to spend your audio credit on something, spending it on something that you get this 55 much. 55 hours. Yeah, is it still just one credit for, for us? Yeah. 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 Um, like, you know, you could spend it on something that gives you, there are a lot of books that give you 12 hours uh-huh. or nine hours um, that I have spent credits on. And you get 55 hours on this one. That's just because that's what people expect um, in a lot of ways from... Um, from novels or and even from films you don't pay more for a film that's twice as long uh that's just our for whatever reason the way that our market system has worked for entertainment you you pay by the experience not by the length of that experience in most cases um but you know books do go up a little bit once they get bigger but not double (coughs) or (coughs) in the case of a stormlight book four times but um, regardless, uh, on audiobooks, you don't pay anymore. Uh, you just pay that one credit. So, so yeah, that's, that's, why, that's why we see uh, so many people going to audio on them. So, so one, one thing maybe to, to, to point out with kind of that fits along with this question is if you uh, get a deal from a small publisher, they may not pay you in advance. And at that point, you have to look at you know, right. what are they offering you because if you are at all interested in self-publishing, that might be the point for you to say, Maybe I should look into self-publishing this. Yeah, with a with a small press, I think the better deal you can get is to have a small press handle physical, and you keep audio and ebook. Yeah. Um, but they aren't going to like that because you know that's yeah. they're getting. If it were Brandon Sanderson, they'd be getting seventeen percent of the business. Um, but uh, for some place not offering in advance, yeah. But they might be able to offer you distribution that's really hard to get for physical books. It can be. By yourself. Um, and it depends. It can be. Some of the smaller presses get their books into bookstores very consistently. Yeah, they do. Uh, what My rule of thumb is always if you can't go to multiple bookstores in multiple states and just walk in and find their books on the shelf already, not in the, oh, we can order it in for you. It's right here. If it's not on the shelf, then... That is not a publisher that you probably um, want to be with or um, need <laughs> or need unless, you know, there are very specific sets of circumstances that, that would match the person. Um, and, you know, we've done things with a small press. We, we did mm-hmm. Emperor's Soul with Tachyon. And, and they've been great. They are great. Yeah. And you can find Emperor's Soul in any bookstore. Uh, it's not in every bookstore because no book is. They sell out and stuff. But the, if you walk into a bookstore, there is a a good chance you will find Emperor's Soul there. Uh, and they've done a great job of that distribution. So we've had nothing but wonderful things to say about them. And that's a small press. Mm-hmm. Um, and they are out there. But be very careful. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, I would look at, if you were going with, uh, with a traditional publisher, what does a good deal look like? They are offering you uh, $50,000 
per book for two books. Um, and they are leaving you with your foreign rights and they're taking at most uh, World English, which I still wouldn't even really want to give them, but s depends on the publisher. Some of them are better at that. And or Spanish for North America. Um, you know, um, at 50,000 per book, you could give them audio, right? Your agent may be able to talk on this, but that's enough um, that, you know, most of the publishers are not signing deals with new authors that don't give them audio. But at that point, that's what I would, where I'd say, okay, this is worth taking a, going uh, traditionally published. This means that I'm, um, I've got a decent chance of them doing a good marketing blitz on it. It's going to be in all the bookstores. So they're spending that much on it. Barnes & Noble is going to take it. Uh, the indies are going to take it. I'll be in front of reviewers. Um, and I can live on $50,000 a year. Uh, remember that that $50,000 doesn't go as far as you think it does because you're going to be paying 15% of that to your agent and you're going to be paying an extra 7.5% in America to self-employment tax. Uh, that And that doesn't count insurance. Um, but I think you could probably make that, you know, you could live on that uh, while you're writing the next books, which is what an advance is supposed to do for you. Uh, an advance that does not let you live on it while you're writing the next books. Um, once upon a time, I was fine with taking myself because you know what? Um, you know, yeah. Depends on where you live too, right? Yeah. If you really want to be an author and that's what you're making, you might want to look at the cost yeah. of living if of you, different states, living, right? Uh, if you're living in San, downtown San Francisco, that is just not going to play. Right. Um, so, but anyway, that's what I would, in my ignorance, not selling right now, say is what a good deal looks like right now. Uh, never give them uh, film rights. Uh, publishers don't know what to do with them. They will try to take them. Don't give them foreign rights with the asterisks of sometimes world English, which uh, is, is okay to give them. Never give them anything more than that or the, the Spanish language, North American. Uh, another question is, are there any mythologies that you have hoped to incorporate into the Cosmere in some form, like Celtic, Norse, Egyptian, or Chinese? Uh, no, uh, that's not really where how I look at it. Um, like, I don't generally say, I'm going to be inspired by this mythology. I know a lot of writers do, um, and that's fine. I tend to look and say, this part of this mythology is really interesting. Uh, it says something about this culture. You know, the Norse mythology that they're going to lose, right? Ragnarok is going to happen. That is fascinating, right? Um, the idea that Greek and Roman mythologies had these different names for what were essentially the same gods that slant, that over time became more and more like one another is a really cool idea. I like that aspect of it. Um, you know, um, but it's not like, even when I wrote the Spren, which have some roots in Shinto and some, um, some Asian mythology, it's not like I'm sitting down saying, I'm going to make an I'm going to use this. What I'm saying is what fascinated me. The idea that everything has a soul fascinates me, right? Uh, the idea from Plato that there are multiple realms of existence, uh, you know, these things mix together. And there certainly there are other seeds like that that I'm, I'm still, that I will incorporate. But I don't sit down and say, this is the time to do this. Um, once in a while, I'll use a culture like that and say, um, you know, I'm going to use the linguistics of this culture and kind of base some things on this culture because it is, uh, it is interesting to me. You've seen me do that with the horn eaters, right? Um, but mythology is not as much. Um, you touched on this a little bit in the last answer, mm -hmm. uh, but people were wondering what the process is like to get a cover quote or learn from a famous author. So, um, there are lots of ways that it happens. I got my early cover quotes when they're much more important when you're brand new. Um, like Robin Hobb gave me one because I did a book signing next to her and just chatted with her. She was just super nice. Robin Hobb is like the matriarch of the fantasy genre. She is, she adopts everybody that I've seen her meet. She adopted me, uh, just delightful human being. Um, and afterward, I'm like, would you consider giving me a cover quote? And usually you ask, would you consider reading the book to potentially give a cover quote? Because you're never asking for a quote, you're asking for the read. And if the author likes the read, then they will give you a quote. Uh, that's kind of the, the thing. And if they don't like it, generally the kind of understood thing is that they're just not going to say anything, right? Um, and if 
if they don't like the book, they're not going to trash it. But if they like it, they'll give you a quote. Um, and so uh, that is how I got my quotes. The publisher often calls in favors to make this happen. And so does the agent being like, will you read this? Um, like with Elantris, um, you know, I asked Scott Card, right? Um, I had the, the, the church connection. I didn't know him, but um, I knew he had a review thing on his blog. Um, and uh, I asked if, uh, you know, he, he would be willing to give it a read. You were at the same publisher. Yeah, I knew his niece, yeah. right? Um, like, you know, when the, the world of, uh, of, of people who belong to the Church of Jesus Christ is a very, you know, we're <laughs> very, we know each other, right? Um, like, find, it was not a big surprise to me to find out that Ben, who had become my friend at college, grew up next door to my grandma, right? It's like, oh, this just happens. Uh, it's, it's, it's a small world. Isaac's from Idaho Falls also. And mm -hmm. it's not like I even I knew we, that. Yeah, but, we didn't even know yeah. each other. But, you know. Uh, but, yeah, so, you know, like, my wife taught Oz Donny Osmond's kids in middle school, right? <laughs> like, you just do because of whatever. Um, and so... I just said, hey, would you be willing to read it? He did. Uh, the publisher went to Robert Jordan and George Martin, which they had very lofty, lofty aspirations with that, which I appreciate. That was Moshe. Um, but for Robert Jordan, they just sent the arc to him, and it went into the many, many, many arcs that he got. He just had uh, a wall. Harriet showed me when I was there, and we found Elantris in that that just <laughs> was in the big stack, right? Um, and Robert Jordan wasn't feeling well at the time. He just was not giving a lot of blurbs. It wasn't just me, but... I now, I can really empathize. There are way more books getting published than you can read. And I really want to be reading my students' and my friends' books, right? Um, and so uh, George Martin uh, read Elantris and said, eh, too high magic for me. It's not really my thing. Um, he doesn't prefer stories that have this whole, you know, magic is a, is a thing that you have to figure out and then solve the problem with. Just wasn't his thing. Uh, had a very nice, polite, uh, you know, said, fun book. I wish you a lot of luck. It's not for me to blurb. Um, and I've always appreciated that, right? Like, that was that's exactly what you want to get from someone. You don't want someone to feel they have to blurb it and then, you know, or things like that. Like, it was really nice of him to even take the time to write back and say it's not for me. Um, and that, that's a good thing to point out yeah. too, is that you, you mentioned it's either, you know, you get a quote or if they don't say anything, they may not have liked it. It actually yeah. is more likely it went onto the yeah, stack of Robert Jordan's that didn't yeah. get to it because, because you get busy, right? Like um, I still have a few students that got published that I haven't read right. their books. Um, I, I've read most of them, but there's a couple I haven't. Um, and so... Um, there's just, yeah, there's been several books, uh, that we've gotten that are really great books, but it's like, is this going to work well for the audience? Which is right. kind of the George Martin thing. You yeah. know, it's, it's not quite is this a good thing for yeah. my audience. And, you know, I could probably agree with, uh, with George, right. That mm -hmm. I'm sure there are a lot of people who like George's work that like my work, but a George Martin cover quote kind of indicates a certain type of book, right. um, that my book was not. Um, and so I didn't know that at the time. I had no clue how this all worked, but looking back, I'm like, anyway, I've always really, uh, really appreciated that from George. He's always just been a class act to everyone I know. Um, I've told this story many times, but, uh, my George, my best George Martin <laughs> story is the, the story when, um, when I lost the Campbell Award, which was uh, is now called the uh, Amazing or the Astounding Award. Astounding. I Astounding believe. Award. The uh, the Best New Writer Award, right? Um, and uh, I lost it, and so I was at a party later that night with my editor, who got into all the you know exclusive parties. So I was at at the chili tasting. Uh, there's this kind of famous chili tasting that happens. It's a closed door party. You have to know somebody to get in. I didn't even know any of this. Moshe just took me to him, right? I. And so I'm sitting there and I'm kind of uh, looking sad and George Martin wanders by and he says, ah, don't worry, kid. I lost that damn award the first year it was offered. And then he gave me his little badge that he would give out to people. It says Hugo Loser on it. It has a, like a, a Hugo rocket that's bent. Uh, it patted me on the shoulder and then went off and got some chili. Um, and that's just, that's just George, right? Uh, I've, I've, I've heard dozens upon dozens of stories like that. Um, and no one has a mean word to say. So, um, you know, he's, he's, he, he takes care of the community also. Uh, I really like George. Um, 
but yeah, like the book was the wrong book for him to cover quote. Um, and so he didn't. And that's, you know, we've read great books where I'm like, ah, you know, for me, too much sex and violence, even if I like the book, is not a thing that I, I'm going to say to my audience, hey, you should read this. Unless I have like the full review where I can be like, here's something, be aware of this. Like I'll post on my Goodreads sometimes and say, here's a book I endorse, but you need to be aware of this and this and this, where I think I can give more nuance to it um, and recommending things that way. Uh, like I often recommend Nora's work, N.K. Jemison's work, but it has, uh, it has more content um, than I put in my books. And I, I warn people, it's, you know, it's probably across the line for some people. Um, and being able to do that I like, I like giving a full review way better than I like giving a cover quote, but cover quotes are so important in the business that we do give them. Um, but I end up giving more of them to my students and friends because they're people I know, right? Um, they're the books I'm already reading because, you know, when Mary Robinette comes out with a new book, I just read it because I like it. Um, and she's a friend of mine, and so you're going to see more quotes of that. So it is a little bit... Um, Incestuous is the wrong term, but you know what I mean? Insular. Insular, where a lot of times, like, you know, um, uh, The Expanse got a George Martin cover quote. Um, Ty Frank is his assistant, right? That's not surprising. And it's not saying it's saying anything nefarious happened. You just, these are all done as kind of favors and things like that. There's no official way that it happens. And the circle you move in, the people you know, you're going to be reading their books. And you're just way more likely... Uh, to say nice things about them. So understand that that's what cover quotes are. Um, a lot of people think that there is some, that there is more dirty trading going on than there is. I've heard a lot of people be like, oh yeah, he promised he would give a cover quote if he did this. I have seen the, I promise to read your next book if you promise to read this one. I've, I've, done, I've seen that before um, and things like that. Or I've, I, I've sometimes said, hey, I'll read your book if you read one of my students' books for a potential blur. But there's never a, if you don't like it, or if you don't think it matches your audience, never an indication you have to blurb. Uh, and I've had people not give blurbs in those situations, which I totally respect, right? Like that's, I would, I would much rather them not give a blurb than give one if they don't feel it is the right thing to do. And yeah, and you're not gonna give a blurb if it's a book that you, yeah, you know, it's it, they're still yeah. honest, even if they are insular. But they are insular and they do tend to, um, yeah. Um, they do tend to be a little bit hyperbolic also, right? Like, uh, you're going to, you're going to say the good things about the books, um, rather than, right? Like you don't highlight, like er, lots of books, there are legitimate gripes about, but you're going to highlight what's good. And if you liked it enough, you're going to blurb it. So I don't know. There, there, there's not as much mystery behind it as you may think. But there is quite a bit of, uh, of just casualness behind it, uh, if that makes any sense. And luck and experience. timing. Yep. Mm -hmm. If you happen to send in a book when some, an author is yep. looking to read a book and yep. you, and it happens to be interesting to them. That's what happened with, uh, with Robin Hobb. Um, I sent the book in and her daughter was just looking for a book to read. I think it was her daughter. Mm -hmm. might have been her son. Um, and they're like, oh, this one came in, I'll read this. And they're like, wow, this is great. Mom, you should, you should actually read this one. And then she read it. She's like, oh, good. It was great. And gave us, uh, gave us a blurb. But it happened because uh, one of her, her children wanted a book to read at the time and read it and liked it. And, and the Scott Card thing was a, a similar thing, right? It's, it, he picked it up and read it. And, yeah. and well, then he had a review column. And he's like, I, I review yeah. a couple books every, every month. This is the one that's here. Uh, you know, I have a connection to this guy. I'm going to read the book. And then and he liked it. I actually said after the fact, I'm like, I was really worried you'd hate it and trash it. He's like, I'm not going to trash a book by a new author. Understand, nobody's going to, as an author, trash a new author's book. Reviewers, that's their job. If they don't like the book, like, um, but, you know, we, we just won't say anything. Um, the, a new author does not need Brandon Sanderson getting up and saying, yeah, I didn't really like it. They, there's already enough. The, da stat, the deck is stacked against you enough that I'm just not going to say anything uh, because if other people like it, like it's taste, it's art, right? Um, I, I, I'm not offended when people like things I don't like. In fact, I think that's cool. They can explain to me why they like it and I can learn a little bit more about them and the world, right? So um, if I don't like something, I just don't blurb it. Um, and So that, that uh, Scott Card quote is actually what put you back on my radar because mm. we had been at the leading edge, but kind of just sort of passed, right? Right. 
but we knew a lot of the same people. And then I saw that and I'm like, I think I know this guy from the leading edge. And then looked you up, took your class. And mm-hmm. so, you know. And introduced me to my wife. And so. So Sc- Scott's blurb is what put me on that path. Scott's blurb. Well, just on why the... I got married. <laughs> In a roundabout <laughs> way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. If Laura hears about that, she's going to be like, ah! <laughs> The fact that I'm his niece maybe got you that, so she can claim that she <laughs> she's behind me marrying Emily. But then whoever convinced me to go to Leading Edge could be like, right. oh, this you is, met Laura at Leading Edge, so... This is the yeah. butterfly wings mm-hmm. causing a hurricane yes. in the Gulf, right? Mm-hmm. And you can trace that all the way back to my high school teacher who, who handed me the little thing for the writing contest. It was at a local science fiction convention, which is the first time I ever went to a convention because I, I went because I was, you know, in the running for the contest and then discovered sci-fi conventions, which is why I started going at BYU to LTUE, which is where I heard about Leading Edge, and yeah. <laughs> so someday this will be a, um, a biopic, but yeah. they'll add time travel to it, and there will, I'll be all these moments where... Uh... Man, my biopic would be so boring, because there's not a place where I get addicted <laughs> to drugs and drive everybody <laughs> who loves me away from me, um, and then come back and go to rehab and learn to re-love life again. Um, like, That's why they have to add time travel. Yeah, they, they don't have that one. What are they going to do? Uh, make he's, it up. He sat in a room for a long, long time writing books, and then one day someone liked it and paid him money for it. And then there was Chicken Scouts. And then that turned somehow into Chicken Scouts. Yeah. Uh, final question? Sure, final question. Um, what do you do when your subplots have subplots? Subplots have subplots? Um, so, <clears throat> normally... Um, I leave them, right? Because a subplot subplot is usually something that you are mentioning so infrequently that it does not distract from the story. When they're things that I do, they are just, you know, really kind of minor things. Like, you know, Lopin becoming the king of Alvcar, right? Which he did, um, but isn't really in the books and he mentions once in a while. That's a sub-subplot. Okay, Lopin's a subplot character. <coughs> You're learning very slowly and occasionally about how he goes through his Knights Radiant Oaths and things like that. And in his life, there was a subplot that is um, about, you know, his relationship to his cousins. And there's another subplot that is about, you know, this thing he did to save uh, to save Elokar and stuff like that. Um, I just leave the little lines in here and there. And then if I end up having a chance, like uh, Don Shard delves a little bit more into Lopen because I have a chance to use him as a viewpoint character. Then I have the seeds for those things to expand into kind of full subplots instead of sub sub subplot subplots um uh but i think what they're asking is probably something i haven't had a big problem with which is what happens when either your side stories become more interesting than your main stories or when you are getting lost in the weeds of you know we had this subplot but it is mutating and taking on this life of its own and things like that much more of a problem for discovery writers uh generally than outliners so it can happen to outliners and I uh, often give the advice I've heard, which is uh, decide if that subplot makes its own book, right? Like when I cut the whole Mad Prince sequence from Elantris, what Moshe told me is, look, this is a great character. He's really interesting. He's quirky. Save him for another book. It's it, Right here, it's distracting from the main story. Cut this whole sequence. And he was right. And actually, I think it was Joshua who said that, um, as, I, as I recall. Um, and he was right, and I cut it out, and I never used the character again because he wasn't a great character, but uh, I thought he was at the time, and it was more, it was easier for me to give up on it by cutting him out and saying, I'll, I'll do him justice at some point in the future. Um, so either being very delicate with a light touch on some of these sub-subplots, or cut him out completely and write a character at some point that has that as a main, main plot of their character arc, and do it justice. That's what I would recommend. And we are finished, so Kara can be happy that we have signed all of these things to be shipped off tomorrow. Uh, Sean Speakman, I'm sorry, I will get to those, I promise. Um, Those may end up being the thing I do at writing group. Um, Because these days, when we sit at writing group, Kara always hands me something to have to be doing while I'm talking. Um, But uh, thanks for hanging out for this extra long stream. One more reminder, Backer Kid is up until the 7th of September. Through the seventh. Through the seventh. Mm-hmm. Um, and so make sure you go in, look at the things, order anything you want to order. 
Choose your night's rating in the poll we sent you, the email we sent you. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we will see you probably in three weeks, right? We aren't going to do one next week. Um, uh, we, we did this week's instead of that. And then we would have skipped a week. And so we have to wait till we get in the next uh, stack yeah. of Way of Kings to sign. Which they're working on. Which they're working on. So when that comes in, we will be back with another live stream. Um, until then, uh, take care, guys. Uh, I'm going to make sure to get Don Shard out to you as soon as is reasonable. Uh, thank you so much.